Hello, 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 and we are streaming. Let's have a look. Let's see what's happening. Just checking the chat room and making sure we have everything happening. Yeah, just making sure all is good and that we are indeed live. Uh, okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Gaz Williams and welcome to The Gaz Williams Show. Uh, I am absolutely delighted tonight that our special guest is Mr. Carvus Torabi. Now, Carvus is, uh, is an incredible musician. He's a guitarist. He's a singer. He's the front man of Gong. He inherited Gong and we will be talking about this when we talk to him shortly. He is also, uh, he's got a very interesting back history as well that we'll talk a little bit about as well because... Carvus is, I mean, Gong is one of my all-time favourite bands, and another of my all-time favourite bands is Cardiacs, and Carvus was also in Cardiacs too, so I am super excited. In fact, why not? Why not? Let's have a look. Let's bring the man in now. Carvus, here he is. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hello, indeed, and welcome to the show. Big pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. So, I mean... My normal show format, I typically start with a little bit of my Euro rack adventure or whatever I've been up to. And I've been up to a bunch of different things. Um, so if you don't mind, we will come back to you shortly. I'm just going to excitedly show what I've just installed into my rack because I literally just installed it about half an hour ago. <laughs> and I'm dying to play with it. So without further ado, and Carvus will be along and you can... By all means, chip in and uh, and and comment. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, guys. You know, you can, I'm looking forward to watching you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so right. Okay, now the rack. Here we go. And what is new here? This is the Sea Devils filter. And this is from Suit and Tie Guy or STG Sound Labs. Now, Suit and Tie Guy, he is well royalty absolute royalty in the euro rack world not only does he run suit and tie guy and makes modules he is also the guy who's behind uh knobcon in chicago which is the annual i mean sadly not this year for obvious reasons uh convention for all things synthy and tweaky now this particular filter then i mean on the face of it, it looks fairly simple we've got a frequency we've got a response response that would normally be uh, resonance but i think it's called response for historical accuracy and and an amount where we can control that amount via a cv input but this is based on the filter from the ems synthy i think or it may be um from well it's certainly an ems filter design so this is an actual British filter. And I'm fairly sure that David Cockerell would be the man behind it now. He is an incredible person and somebody I think is super underrated. Because, of course, EMS were the first British synthesizer company, really. you know, And, in fact, one of the world's first synthesizer companies, full stop. Um, but one of the things that's kind of curious about the EMS synthesizers is that they haven't been cloned yet or they've just starting to be cloned. So there's been something a little bit of the exotic and uh, they've been extremely expensive as well. Um, I was lucky enough, oh gosh, about 20 years ago to borrow a certain Thipol Sandra's VCS3 for a, for a few months and um, had an incredible time. So Carvus, I talk about the VCS3. Does that mean anything to you? I think Miquette uses a VCS in um, Steve Finnish band. Is that right? Yes, it is right. Miquette's your old Yeah, um, you know, Brian Eno famously was using one in Roxy Music yeah. as well. You know, And it's this kind of like angled wooden thing without a keyboard, but it's got a joystick and uh, it's got the pin board as well, which is like a matrix, so you can route things around. Yeah. For, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, also, can you name me a tune which features the VCS3 almost in its entirety. You know, the song is built up of the VCS3 and is one of the best-selling albums, on one of the best-selling albums of all time. Is it on Dark Side of the Moon? It is on Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah so on the run uh, yeah okay <laughs> there you go yeah. and that's very much about that oh god i wonder if i could play that it was, it was like that old thriller so yeah <laughs> yeah but i mean yes yeah, so i mean if you think about that um on the run track of dark side of the moon i mean you know dark side of the moon it's not exactly a conventional album but the instrumentation is fairly conventional on most of the songs and then that tune comes in it's quite early on isn't it it's about maybe third track in or something and uh I thought it was so mind-blowing that I used to sneak into a pub at dinner time. They had, it was one of the first ever CD jukeboxes I'd ever seen. And it had, because uh, it had all the tracks on, uh, of, normally on a jukebox, it would just be the singles. But once CD jukeboxes started coming on there, it meant that you could play, you know, odd tunes or things on albums. So I used to sneak into this pub and, and put on On The Run. I'd put it on to play four or five times. <laughs> <laughs> just like thinking it was like a really kind of naughty thing to do or just like could to warp people's minds um yeah that's the sort of thing i was getting up to when i was 16 <laughs> um so yes i'm just going to flick back to this then um so don't worry about me <laughs> <laughs> you know um i will uh oh i should create a little window ah uh, with my little switcher i can't bring in a third screen just done a review of this switcher and i was complaining about that it'd be nice to be able to have three but anyway i'm stuck with two so um but anyway so this filter i think it'd be quite nice to have a look at it so i'm going to play to to give the filter its most clearest sort of description of sound i suppose i'm just going to play a sawtooth from the the mini brute which i've got here just beneath i'm just going to tilt the camera down a little bit da -da! okay so that's the uh i'm going to play the keys there but the uh so we can have a little listen just to see what the characteristics of this is because that's one of the things when you start dabbling around with synthesizers um to kind of like learn about you know why would you want to choose different filters and what's quite nice with this euro rack setup at the moment is is that the mini brute that's just out of, just off the screen has got the steiner parker filter which is a multi-mode filter but it's got an interesting character uh, and i've got the sub harmonic on with the famous 12 d uh, 24 db moog ladder filter and now yes a british filter <laughs> well made in america but a british original british design i suppose um so let's have a little listen then. So I'm going to play a real simple sound first. Uh, let's, yep. Okay, so quite a br sort of bright, buzzy sawtooth. Uh -huh. Right. Let's just do a sweep. Oh, let's try patching it in first, shall I? <laughs> uh, okay, signal input. So this is the output then coming out of the out of the mini brute and then gonna be and then patching in. Right, okay, let's try that again. Okay. So it's quite a uh, saturated filter sound. Oh, there's a nice burn on there. Yes, it, it will self-oscillate, as we will find. So, response. It's quite curious to call it response, um, as it is essentially resonance. But um, Okay, this is half resonance now. Let's see what the bottom, let's see what the bottom end is like. Cause f Ooh. Look at that. So that's really nice straight away. Normally with your filters, you lose a lot of low end, don't you? Oh, with some resonance. Okay, and get, let's go into self-oscillation then. Okay, that's what we like. Oh. Oh, that's characterful. It's got, got 
the resonance is on eight now. Oh, that's nice. Hmm. So, so Calvus, just going to bring you back in there. <laughs> oh hi, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just kind of conscious. I don't want to seem rude to my guest. Just um... no, no, no. I was enjoying. It. Don't have, you don't have to keep bringing me back to, to ruin to ruin your sonics, man. <laughs> oh no, no, it's cool. But because because you see, I was thinking about um, well. Just so the audience, I mean, I'm sure a lot of the audience will be aware of Gong, but I mean, so it's definitely something we want to talk more about in the show. But one of the things that was um, very notable about a lot of Gong's 70s stuff was the how how important sort of synthesizers were in their, their sound, in their very textured sound. Um, but well, certainly, I, the, certainly the stuff's... Sort of once Tim Blake had joined, yeah. Tim Blake, that's what I was going to come. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Tim Blake, and so the Crystal Machine was that the name of his synth rig or just the name of an album? Uh, well, I know it's the name of an album. I don't. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not the. I'm not an aficionado on Gong uh, knowledge. You know. <laughs> I love. I love them. I love the music. Yeah. I love being part of it. But I'm not. You know, this is more of a, a Gong fans so that it's probably like. Very big in Gong Law, but uh, <laughs> I know that I know the album Crystal Machine. Oh yeah, no, it's it, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the track. I think it's a French title. Is one of like for me the archetypal so synth. Well, when I think of synth music, I kind of think of that. I think, you know, I love the Tonto's expanding headband. Um, I love the early Tangerine Dream. I really like synth sounds, which are kind of quite dark and textured and dirty. You know. More. David Allen, David Allen felt that um, that Tim Blake should have been, you know, should have been as successful as Brian Eno. He thought they were, he saw them as being kind of equals. Interesting. Um, but you know, Tim, Tim did what what, what he did. But I, I know uh, David Allen thought extremely highly of his his playing and and what he did. And particularly that that period in time, I think around the time of sort of um, you know you, that he's just really capturing something utterly unique and magical. Oh, absolutely! You is you is a that's a good place for gong for for. I actually would start people off on you. I think. Well, is yeah, it? maybe. I mean, my my way in was um, my way in was um, flying teapot. But I, I still too. think, down to my head, my favourite. Uh, well, I don't, I don't have a favourite, but Camembert Electric. I oh. think that that would be as, as, as well. It depends on the person, doesn't? It? There's so yeah. many different. There's so many different gongs. There's no two gong albums that are alike. No. And you've got the sort of fusion yeah. gong of the late 70s, which, which isn't really to my taste, but I think it's just as legitimately gong as, as anything else. I know David thought, again, wasn't necessary to his taste, but I know he felt, well, it's, it's just as much gong as anything else. You know, So gong always always changes its focus and what it's about, really. Because in a way, it is more of a—it's almost more of a philosophy than a band, isn't it, Gong? I, I suppose. Yeah, um, yeah, it's an idea. An yeah, idea. Gong, Gong's an idea, which is why, you know, the the fact that there, there have been that, you know, has been just a constantly sh- changing lineup. It's you know, it's not like Black Sabbath. <laughs> it's not like you, you're going to have those four guys. Yeah. Otherwise, it doesn't work. You know, with Gong, it's you know, it really is. It, it you, know, you say it's a philosophy, yeah. and uh, as long as you sort of you're, you're hip to the philosophy, and you know. You know, you know which way it's going, and it's always going upwards. That's the thing with Gong; it's always got to be propulsive and going upwards. Um, then I think, uh, th- then I think it's, you know, I think it works. I mean, I've, I've got to say that because <laughs> I'm, in the, I'm in the current Gong. Well, I mean, um, but I mean, I think uh, now it feels like the Gong transition is kind of complete. Um, the uh, well, because it's two albums since David's. Pa- yeah, that's right. Yeah, passing, but the new album, um, which is called uh, the Rejoice, collapses. Oh, the universe. Sorry, it's Rejoice. I, I'm dead. That was the 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 universe also collapses. Is fantastic album. Um, Thank um, you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I can't buy a sole credit for it, but you know, I'm <laughs> right now, you know, thank you. <laughs> no, it is. It's a really exciting, uh, very dynamic, uh, quite modern, a modern take. But then there's there's those classic gong moments in there. It it doesn't feel like a. a it feels like it's. You say it's kind of an upward but moving forward trajectory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that. I think it absolutely is that. But I mean. 
there has... and very, you know, very uh, Gong is a vehicle for something you know transformative, yeah, and kind of propulsive and very um, sort of uh, what's the word of it? It's not you know and, and, and kind of positive. It's not it's not the the band for navel gazing. I mean, I save <laughs> I save that you know I I couldn't be bringing the kind of lyrics. I do on, on my solo stuff or that I do in Knife World, which are a lot more introspective and kind of, you know, often a bit maudlin. I couldn't be bringing uh, that into Gong. Uh, so when I came to, well, that, you know, came to writing lyrics for Gong, I had to, I had to find something that felt like me. So I couldn't really go, I couldn't, I didn't feel like I could write about flying teapots or octave doctors. Uh, well, because that's, that was David's David. David, right? yeah. Well, and when it's Gong, while it's, it's central to the Gong law, of course, um, I think it would just be really bogus if I did it, and, and same with the same with sort of David's humour. Yeah, you know, Gong is never a serious band. Well, the musically serious, but I mean, it's never kind of like you know. It's, yeah, this... but, but, um, but I couldn't really, I couldn't bring the, the that humour element because it's that's just not. I don't feel that with what. So we had to find, you know, we had to find something that felt kind of uniquely Gong. Yeah. But also, but uniquely us as well. Yeah. Kind of thing. So I'm glad you say that because you know mm. it, it's you know it can't ever be the same. You can no. There's no point in sort of moaning about it's not being the 76 lineup or the or the or the whatever lineup because <sighs> this is this is the lineup now. Yeah, and it's you know what it's, I mean. It's not like a legacy band because it's, we're doing. I'd say the the last tour we're doing 80 percent new material. Oh, nice. So yeah, so you know it's a, it's a strange position to be. In. <laughs> yeah, and I mean. I'm going to just back up a little bit, just for people who may be new to Gong, and just just to just to kind of go over the the backstory a little bit because it is fascinating. Because and we've you've heard us mention David, and we're talking, of course, of the great and sadly no longer with us, uh, David Allen, who was, I mean, I was fortunate enough to have met him on on a number of occasions and did a little bit roadieing for him once as well, which was uh, a lot of fun. Um, but he he was, um, I think. He's a little bit older than the rock and roll than the, than the sort of sixties rock. He was sl- he he was a he was a beat poet. He was that's right, yeah. And he, yeah. And he was in. He moved to Paris in about what was it, nineteen sixty two or nineteen sixty? Or he was in. It was certainly uh, in in the days when the beat poets had sort of fled America and gone to live in Paris and the left bank. And he lived in Allen Ginsberg's flat, I believe. At, right, okay. At, um, so the, the thing that's interesting about this is it, it sort of is, is before kind of rock music became, alt, you know, before the 60s sort of happened, really. This is a... He, he told me, he told me, he, you know, initially he hated rock and roll. He was a jazz guy. Right. Um, and he didn't, you know, he hated rock and roll until he heard the Yardbirds. That was what, that's ah. when the light sort of went on and then, okay, rock you know, rock and roll okay. sort of thing. But, I mean, the thing is, David's an art, David was, you know, an artist. So mm. whether whether it was poetry or painting or cartooning or music, you know, he, he approached it all like an artist. Well, int- and uh, which, which I think, like, like all the great, like, like all the great rock and rollers, came, came much more from a from an art background, whether it's sort of Sid Barrett or Pete Townsend, you know, of, of yeah. that era. Yeah, well, I'm just... I think real kind of art school types. Well, if I just cut now to this camera... Now, if I go, if I focus beyond the the rack, can you see those pictures? I can see some David Allen pictures. You can there, see yes. some David Allen pictures. Yes, yeah, yeah, so yeah, I, got, yeah. I got a bunch of them in my room. So wow. some, some of David Allen's yeah. art there. I know, I know, I'd know that style immediately. Yeah. yeah, he's a brilliant illustrator. I think he really is. Really, yeah, really, yeah. really great. Um, oops, let's go back here. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so he went to France, and he, I think. Is it? Did he meet? I know that part of the story because David told me this himself, and I'm just going to remember the, the order in which things happened. Um, but Robert Graves, the author of I Claudius, do you know that? Part? Yeah, yeah, and um, and uh, yeah, and the the white the white goddess, and also um, goodbye to all that. Um, yeah, they him and <clears throat> him and Robert White. Um, Robert White was very friendly with him, wasn't wasn't he? Ooh, That's the um, yeah. Mm. Let's let's just back up before we introduce Robert White. I, then I don't want to I don't want to expose my ignorance. I don't know the full story. I just oh. know snippets of just of what, either what I've read in Gong Dreaming or or just what David told me. You know. So. Well, David said to I mean, this is a story as David told me was that he had um, 
he decided to set up a band in he decided to set up a rock band in Britain and he was living in Paris at the time but then he was hitchhiking and he was I think he hitched I think he got the ferry to Dover and then I think he was hitching and ended up unintentionally ending up on the outskirts of Canterbury which Canterbury's down in the corner in Kent I guess not too far from Dover and and he sought some lodgings there and he happened to lodge in a house that had a 16 year old living in the house who happened to be Robert Wyatt. Yeah, yeah, that's so, right, yeah. So for Robert Wyatt, one day, David Allen turns up. <laughs> now, this groovy, this world, well, this groovy, you know, jazz. Yes, beatnik, and yeah. Robert, um, David Allen, in his bag, he had somewhere in the region of 20,000 acid trips on him, which was still, well, le- which, okay. cool. which was yeah. still legal. It hadn't been made illegal. Um, I think, are we talking 1962? Two, I'd be able to work it out from how old Robert Wyatt is, but um, so David Allen befriended Robert Wyatt, and Robert Wyatt and his friends they were all like serious 16 year olds who were all very into jazz, they were like, uh, and they 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 looked down their nose at rock and roll. But David, you know, being the kind soul he was, give them loads of acid, <laughs> and I mean, I think it's super interesting in that. Acid LSD hadn't become the big transformatory cultural phenomenon that it did just a few years after this. Um, LSD was very much considered a uh, an intellectual's drug, and uh, oh, yeah, yeah, you know. So it's so these guys who were like really into their jazz, these youngsters, suddenly dosing up on LSD, and um, they well. I mean, that's the foundation of um, Soft Machine, isn't it? I mean, uh, were the Wildflowers before... Uh, the Wildflowers before Soft, Mach- Soft Machine, yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm-hmm. But, um, see, I get a bit hazy now, because that was when David first met Robert then, which, as I say, was early 60s. Um, but this... So David Allen sort of psychedelicized these these youngsters and turned them into... Uh, <laughs> crazies um, in a good way I think um, but then by 1966 he'd formed well was it called a David Allen trio I think before it was called Soft Machine but then it did become Soft Machine under David Allen didn't it um, and one of the things which I think is great and again this is from David so I'm assuming I'm assuming it's all 100% true <laughs> he um Soft Machine uh, so essentially psychedelicized Jimi Hendrix um, and David Allen. Actually, I, don't, I don't know so much about the, the sort of relationship between, between Soft Machine and LSD. I know that Wyatt was much more of a, a booze, boozer than a, a, a druggist sort of thing. So, I mean, this is, I, I, I can't, I don't, I don't know all the stuff you're telling me. I don't know whether it's, you know, I, I haven't heard this. So okay. I, I, well, I, I mean, all... I'm not. I'm not some, I, to be honest, I don't know the great history of these these times. You probably know a lot more about this than oh. I do. I mean, this is just the stories that he told me. So, um, oh, okay. uh, but I mean, Jimi Hendrix would end up jamming with Soft Machine. Uh, but I think that what happened though then, I know Jimmy, Jimmy and um, Robert were pals. Yeah, not Robert. Sorry, Jim, well, of course, Robert. But Jimmy and David were pals because I know um, David was very sort of had this real kind of inferiority complex when Jimi Hendrix showed up about his guitar playing. And at this time when God. Jimi Hendrix said to him, hey, just just stick with your thing, man. <laughs> you know, that was a real a real big deal to David. Uh. Just like, oh, well, if J- Jimmy's told me to stick with my thing. And of course, his thing being in, really inventing, you know, glissando guitar, oh. which I think is one of, one, of, one of the great contributions to yeah. um, yes. sonic contributions. Is this, and just if, um, if your listeners don't know. Yeah. Um, David saw um, Sid Barrett playing, but I think it's Zippo Lighter, and then sort of developed this technique from there, which is it's um, playing guitar. I can, I can almost demonstrate it here, but it's, it's, it's playing a guitar with um. Well, I used a screwdriver. Uh, David, uh, you, uh, I know Steve Finnish uses an old sort of gynecological tool, but <laughs> really? you're playing the strings across the strings, and it's you know when, when done when done right, it sounds like an angel sighing you know yeah. it's just absolutely the most the, the, the most beautiful angelic sound i mean but 
when I do it, I'm not I'm not one of the King Gliss players. I think fa- the guy we have in the band at the moment, Fabio Golfetti, oh, yeah. and Steve Hillage himself, they're just both insanely good at Gliss. And often you 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 put them over the two the top two strings, and then you'll compress it and put a bit of overdrive and um, delay at the end of it. But I just I tend to just concentrate on the top string and just play it more like a theremin or a, or a saw. But yes, yeah, it's, it's the most it's the most beautiful sound. Yeah, and is and it is uh, also a very strong part of the gong character as well, isn't it? The sound. Yeah, of the, yeah. Of the gong, yeah, yeah. You know, um, and if, if you were to do some synth geeking, I could sort of set up a situation where I could do some gliss oh, as a demo. Oh if, yeah. If, if, if it came to it, but uh, <laughs> well, I could, well, yeah, well, is that possible now, or is that because um, I can always fill in? Well, if you were, if you were synthing up, it would take me about. Five or ten minutes to oh, set up tops. Let's maybe. let's do it. Let's, let's glitz. Yeah, let's, let's glitz. glitz. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right then. Okay. So, all right. Um, all right. I'll cut back to some Euro rack and then and then give me a shout when you're ready. All right. That's a nice idea. Okay. Oh, <laughs> this is very exciting. I am super super pleased about the way things are going. As I say, you know, Gong. Oof, I'm going to talk more about Cardiacs as well, and also later. I won't also want to. Just talk a little bit more about Carvis's own kind of career as well, because, I mean, he releases a lot of music under different names. I mean, he's got his band, his like large format band, um, Knife World, and then his most recent album, Hip to the Jag, is a solo album under his own name. Um, so lots to talk about there. Anyway, I did say, though, we're going to look at the... Uh, I have to probably refocus the camera, but let's go back to here for a moment. Uh, I'll try and catch up with some uh, comments as well. Uh, everything going well, guys, in terms of the show? It sounds everyone happy in the audience? If you can just say a, a, a resounding yay would be really nice to, uh, to know that you're all okay there. I'm sorry, I've been so uh, fixated here having... Oh, lovely guest. Right. Okay. Now, look, let's have a look. So there's a few things on here on, on, the, um, on the, the rack now that's new uh, that I should show you. Um, I can just... Let me just... I'm just going to turn Carvus out for now. Let him get him ready. I'll bring him back up. Uh, let's go back. Okay, so um, on the rack, we have got next door to the Sea Devils filter is a it's the .com Octave, uh, Octave from STG Labs. Now, on here, let's get the camera around so I can get in a bit tighter. Not an awful lot to see there, but... Um, it's like a octave divider. So there's a threshold control. Uh, so let's uh, take our sound. Oh, this filter. This filter is lovely, though. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to patch that out and I'm going to patch it into this octaver. Let's go signal in here and uh, let's take this one and we're going to go. Right, so I can take an output. I can take like a pulse width uh, and or I can take a square octave, either one octave or two octaves down. So let's just take uh, just a regular square one octave down. Let's put that in and now let's see what happens. What have I done wrong? Nothing. No sound. Threshold. Ooh. Oh, holy cow. Oh, did you hear that? Oh, gosh. Oh, my goodness. That sounds meaty. <laughs> uh, 
great. Gosh, I'm not quite sure what's going on here. When I turn the filter, it doesn't do anything. Ooh. Ah. <laughs> oh, let's go down two octaves. I'm guessing as well then, I guess I could also come out of the, let's have two octaves worth. I'll come out of that and put that into another input here. Holy moly, this is cool. Um, oh gosh, it sounds so cool. Oh, what's going on? Oh, I think a little bit of... That is a beast of a sound. <laughs> I've no idea how that sounds to you guys down the stream, but... God. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, right. I think we're going to go back over to Carvus now. So I'm just going to bring his level back up. I'm not, not ready yet. You're not ready? No, no, give me five, give me a couple of minutes. I've just, I've just got a sound going, but I haven't, I haven't uh, checked it yet. Okay. <laughs> so let's take him out for now. Um, now there is another, there is one, there is a third module. Now we can see, <laughs> I've not got a lot left now. That's a three HP. Now I'm not sure if anything comes in three HP. Um, I, have, I mean, there is that company 2HP who just makes only 2HP, but that would just leave me a 1HP. So, yes, there's a three slot there. And here is uh, what we got left there. Six. I got six. Oops. Um, <laughs> six. I got nine HP left. Mind you, we, that is with the VPME patch notes, which is a little bit of a joke. Um, sort of post-it notes. <laughs> um but here next to it is the jacks, the dot jacks from STG. Now this, I think is new, um, is a passive. It's just simply a quarter inch jack to um, eighth of an inch jack, uh, I guess just, just, but that is super handy for me. I'm so pleased about this because I've got a bunch of things. Um, the Abyss from Dreadbox uh, has got just, full-size jacks on the back of it mm, what else have i got um the retroverb from vimona that's all full-size jacks as well uh and also my analog uh, analog four and rhythm from uh electron with the full-size jacks too so really cool so i'm really interested to see how i can interface with some of my other gear now with full you know otherwise you know the big jack to mini jack mono thing is a bit of a conundrum. I mean, I've got two of those cables, I think, so probably need to get a few more, but that is certainly helpful there. So I've got three, three quarter inch jacks. Um, yeah. <laughs> right, so, uh, so yes. So not much space left, um, but uh, I think as I mentioned earlier, I am going to be taking the subharmonica off. And I, I still haven't decided whether to drill through the casing and to drill and make, you know, make it more or just to use Velcro. That's still in a, a, a get a disting. Yes, a d disting. I've the disting from Expert Sleepers is a digital module that can basically be Mm, I don't know, there's nearly a hundred different uh, algorithms or something for it. So it can just do a whole load of different tasks. Um, yeah, so yes, yes, I'm definitely interested. Um, but right now, as I say, not much space left, but I think once the subharmonicon goes on the top there, I, I have to say the subharmonicon is a joy, an absolute joy. So I think it sort of being part of this is still kind of cool, but... Um, I have a lot of desktop modules uh, over there. I've got to rebuild it all a little bit. But um, 
Yeah, so I quite like the idea of it being able to live over there or, or come and be part of this as well. So might have to be Velcro. <laughs> uh, there's a comment here. I bought a bundle of mini jack to full jack cables from Toman just to plug the Volkers into my mixer. Yeah, bloody nuisance. You're right. <laughs> I need a second case. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> Let's see what's going on. Um, oh, thank you, everybody, for your comments in the chat room. Um, it's a real pleasure to see a lot of old friends there as well. That's nice. Nice to see. I will be reading through these later. Sorry, I can't be quite up on it as much as I'd like to be. Um, let's let's go back here. Anyway, so let's see what else we've got going on. Ah, one thing I should say, though, is I have been having quite a lot of joy with the clouds. Um, in my last episode, I had barely, I'd barely delved into it, but now I feel a lot more um, clued into it. And, you know, clouds is, in Eurorack world, almost like a standard, it seems. Almost everybody has a clouds of some form. This particular clouds is a clone because all um, mutable instruments, I believe, are um, open source. So this is a, a legitimate legal kind of clone. But um, it's as far as I can tell, it's exactly the same in terms of functionality, knob layout and all of the all of the, the patch points. Um, but one of the big things with clouds, which is a lot of fun, is that um, when you get to know what it can do, then you learn that there's actually a bunch of different m modes, like firmwares. I think this has got four in there, and I believe there's some other ones that have been made. Uh, Parasite is one that I've heard about. Um, so that's quite that's quite fun. So it means that clouds it can be an evolving uh, an evolving experience, and it very much is an evolving experience. Anyway, let's uh, let's put this big monster sound through clouds then. <laughs> right, just to make sure. <laughs> oh, that was such a meaty sound. It's too meaty for effect. It's kind of um, uh, right. Let's have a look. Um, so just to explain what is happening here, I have got, um, the, this, the dope for A119 here is, um, the left and the right pan I'm using actually as a, an effect sense. So right pan is just going straight out to the rosy. Left pan is going into the clouds, sort of mono in, and then it's coming out, stereo out of the clouds and into the radical technologies effects and then out in stereo back into the stereo return of the rosy and uh, make noise rosy on the output there. So that's that's the signal path of the output. So it's quite cool though, because I like it. This little mixer gives me four inputs and four effect sends the way I've got it configured. Um, uh, I have also been playing my OPZ through this, um, coming in into the asymmetric input of the A119. <laughs> Oh, it's good. Uh, so oh, let's let's crank the feedback up here. Let's go up a few octaves. Whoa! I'm not entirely sure what. Mm. I don't quite know. I don't quite get what's happening with this Octaver. I, I haven't got any instructions for it and I've only just put it in. So I haven't actually played around with it. Um, so I think just for the moment, I'm just going to bypass that because it's, um, I'm confused. <laughs> and maybe chat room can help, but that's, um, yeah. Uh, I was going to have a word with John from Suit and Tie Guy, but I don't think we've got time. Right. <laughs> Not quite the monster sound. Howard Scar in the chat room. Hey, Carvus, Howard is in the chat room. I, I think you may have met him once, but Howard Scar has gong heritage. In fact, the first time I ever saw gong live was in Glastonbury in the year 2000. I actually left watching 
David Bowie midway through. I went midway through because I knew Gong were playing and it was fantastic. And Howard was the keyboard player. Yes, I think you may have met you may have met Howard. I think we have met. Yes, I think so. Yeah. He is an absolute legend. He's a legendary sound designer. I mean, he he is next level sound designer. He is uh yeah. He's like almost like the king of sound design. <laughs> um, imagine describing I'm, I imagine describing someone as previous level. I might just yeah, the trick that Previous level, not Howard, of course. Just I love as, as a as a description. Yeah, no, no, no. I've, you yeah. know, and I've seen that man. Yeah, this this sort of previous level. Yeah, previous level. Yeah, I suppose we guitarists as well. You know, who would be previous level? I guess when 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 Steve Vai came out, did it make it Van ha- Eddie Van Halen previous level? Or is that, or is Eddie that... Van Halen will never be previous level. No, <laughs> I was thinking about. Well, saying... I mean, the, the the problem Eddie Van Halen. I don't want to get into it unless you want to go down the Van Halen rabbit hole. A whole, I, I will happily go down. By the way, um, you know, Ed, poor old Eddie. Ed, Eddie gets um, Eddie gets the shit for for the style that he that he pioneered that style. But I mean, Ed, Eddie's that's that's not his style. He's a lot more kind of um, I don't know. I, th- I think he, I think he's a beautiful player. I think he yeah. writes very very nice tunes as well. I'm, I'm very sort of very pro Eddie Van Halen. Well, you know, the, the... plays Panama. <laughs> You know, but um, so, yes, he he gets he gets the rap for all the uh, all, all the sort of like the, the L.A. hair the the hair, hair, metal, hair metal metal whittler, whittlers, the hair metal whittlers. He's just like he's, he's a really really good rock rock and roll guitar. Player, oh, for sure. But I mean, you know, he's one of those people. You know, he the, a synthesizer turns up. He has a little noodle on it and then creates jump. You know, it's one of these things. Yeah, it's do like you know, do you know was a show in the seventies. Get this, you know. Let's let's just work out the enormity of this event. At one point, there was a show, in I think 1978, um, possibly. Yeah. And on the bill was starting the bill, the Ramones, Van Halen, and Black Sabbath. What? I mean, four of the greatest singer, guitarist, drummer, bass player band. <laughs> just think, all three, all three front men: Joey Ramone, Ozzy Osbourne. And David Lee Roth in one place. Three iconic frontmen. Wow. Three three iconic guitar players. Yeah. All that. I mean, the whole band. I mean, you know, I, I, I've, I've seen a poster for it. I just, I find this one single bill one of the most defining moments in rock and roll. <laughs> God, yeah. I mean, I'm surprised there wasn't a massive fight backstage. I don't think there may well have been. Well, I think the band's got on. But, oh, um, oh, I hope so. I'm not sure the order. I think that. I think the kind of I think it may have been in one of these sort of like big dusty arenas in in sort of like mid the Midwest. I think the Ramones didn't go down so well, and uh, as the Ramones came off stage and were getting bottled and and what have you, the um, one of the stagehands or monitor engineers said to Joey Ramone, "Last band I saw go down that badly was the Rolling Stones in 1964." <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah. it was quite a good thing. That's all right. We'll take that then. <laughs> Yeah, gosh. Um, so, are we are we ready to gliss? I can gliss. I mean, I could just set up a nice gliss, improv gliss loop and see where we go. Oh, that would be lovely. What a treat. Ladies uh, and gentlemen, what a treat. The glorious Carlos Tarabi, not only is he here to tell... Let, let me know, um... Yeah. Oh, have you disappeared? Are you there? Oh, no, oh, let me here. know. I mean, just let me know if you can... Um, if, if, you, if I need to swing the microphone around and make it loud, it's just come out of my amp in the in the corner there. Okay, okay let's see what we can do. Yeah. Um, right. So here we have this bit of geekery here. This uh, is a screwdriver once belonging to Steve Davis's dad. <laughs> and now...
Lush. Yeah. Did you hear that? Yeah. Ah. Ha-ha. A bit of a glitch guitar. Yeah. Hi. So it's um, because you know, obviously bringing in in the Ebo or the classic Ebo as well. I mean, I suppose um, when they were doing that though, there wasn't such a thing as an Ebo, was there? When they first invented the Gliss style? I don't know. I've no idea when this came about. I was given this by a friend. It's a special white sort of anniversary edition one. Ooh. But I, I was shocked when I saw how much they really cost if they're not given to you by a friend. <laughs> yeah. Like ninety quid, right? Yeah. But, I but I mean, I, I use it. I use it so often. I mean, it really, it really comes into its own. For um, well, I mean, in the band I do, I mean, I Gong, mean, Easy, but the really the the one is the band I do with Steve Davis and Mike York, the Utopia Strong. And this is where where the the whole, um, you know, certainly live the whole show we do is yeah. improvised. And you know, I don't know if you know the setup. There's two modular synth setups. So you have you have you had Steve as a guest right a, a couple of weeks ago. That's right. Um, so he, you have his setup there, and then you have Michael uh, York, who's on the on the other side, and he has a, a lovely setup. Although he he's got much more, more groovy stuff like a Phoenix and what have you. But he doesn't bring all that, you know, uh, for, for the live setup. And then I I have I, I'm there with my I've got an Indian harmonium, which is going through um, sort of a looper and a delay. And uh, with a volume swell pedal, and then I've got my just my usual sort of rig, just my guitar and pedal board. But uh, I'm mostly not wanting it to, to sort of sound like a guitar. And then we and we we're just setting up often, just setting up these these big long cycles that sort of bounce against each other and build up and play. And you know, and that's that's really how we write the stuff initially, is with these improvised sessions. So it's, it's playing between two modular synth players. Lovely. We've never done that before nice. at all, and uh, it's it's incredible. But <laughs> yeah, it's really allowed me to go much more into those sort of like textural kind of like Ebo and Gliss and like long droney, like setting up very big drones on the um, with the harmonium and what have you. Mm, really nice. It's that mixture of the organic sound of the harmonium mixed in with the yeah. kind of alien soundscapes of the modular. It's so very, it's a great album though. I really enjoyed it. Um, out on Bristol's fine rocket recordings as well. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. John, Johnny, Johnny O'Carroll, Johnny O, Johnny yeah. O'Rocket. Big old, old friend of mine for many, many years. So, that's, oh right, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Go back a long way with Johnny. Um, great. And did John, Johnny did the design? Did he do that? That's a, Johnny did all the artwork. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful, incredible, beautiful. absolutely incredible. He is the. I think I he, have to say. I mean, he, He's such a. Well, that was one of the. All the rocket artwork is so good. Ah, oh, and, and when, when we recorded the album. I don't know. I, was, I didn't. I didn't hear Steve's interview. Was he talking about it at all? We talked uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, ago. We 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 talked. We briefly talked about it. It was something I meant to return back to, but <laughs> the conversation um, went over there. But um, oh, okay. Because yeah. when, when we recorded the album, we did. We didn't. Um, it, it wasn't even meant to necessarily be a band. You know, Steve mm. got all his got all his sort of Euro gear and had been you know messing around with it and. Um, I'd been saying for a while, oh, you know, I would, you know, I'd like to, to do something more with it. He just sort of mess around on his own, and so we, um, I said, oh, well, we should, we should, you know, we'll, I'm happy to do something with you. Come round and, you know, make some music, and then, um, you know, there was Mike York, who's an incredible, uh, an incredible player. Have you heard his his other group, uh, Teleplasmist, which is largely just all modular stuff? They've oh just, no, but I, I a new album actually. But he is a member of Guapo, though, isn't he? Yeah, he's a member of Guapo, that's right. He right. was he was also played in Coil. He plays yes. in a number of um bands. He's in um current ninety three at the moment as well. Oh yeah, cool. And um and uh, and so we got so anyway, what happened is like Mike's a really good pal. Um and so Mike and I went over to Steve's and I didn't I just thought we were jamming, you know. But Mike brought um uh just brought a little very, very basic recording setup with him, where what happened is all Steve's entire setup went into one mono channel and then Mike's entire setup went to, into another mono channel. And then I just had one mic, which I moved between my amp and my harmonium. So three mono things just to see what we sounded like. Well, we, we, we spent the whole day improvising and recorded about eight or nine pieces. Some of them about like 20 minutes long, not fully knowing how, how it sounded because we, we, we only had what was coming through the monitors because we couldn't, they couldn't drown out my guitaring. I didn't want there to be too much spill on the mic. 
yeah. and what have you. Anyway, that we went out for dinner and then came back and listened back to what we'd made. And this stuff was like really, really exciting. And so we'd never planned to be a band. We'd never planned to make an album. But we uh, and as we carried on listening to this stuff, we were like, oh, we could, you know, th these five minutes, we could lose them. But this bit here, what wouldn't this sound good if it had a bit of a, oh, this would sound great with some acoustic guitar on. Oh, what if there was a tambourine on here? And it, we just kept on going until we ended up with this record, you know, that mm. we, we weren't, and then we had to come up with a name for the band. And then we picked like three or four labels that we would we thought would be really good to put this thing out on. One of which was Rocket, who were re really into it, you know. Oh, it's perfect for Rocket. Once Rocket put it out, then we had to try and be a band. Well, Steve had <laughs> never played live before. I mean, me and Mike, well, me and Mike had a lot of experience, but Steve, you know, he wasn't bargaining for that. No. And then, you know, the next thing we're, we're we're going out on tour, and 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 for for Steve, I mean, it took me. I'm 48 now. And really, to go for, to, to do a fully improvised gig, it took me, uh, you know, 47 years. We did our first gig last year. Well, Steve's never played a gig before in his life. And his right, first... Straight in. His, his first, delay, you know, yeah. straight in, just full-on improvisation kind of gig. I'm just going to back up a little bit, just in case people don't know, when we're referring to Steve, we're referring to, of course, the great Steve Davis, who was my guest on the last episode. Uh, but the thing that's just astonishing for anyone who's grown up in Britain with Steve Davis is, like, he is such a household name and such... he And he was... You know, he, the the kind of image of him was as the world's most boring man. It's just so ridiculous of all celebrities that you could have, yeah. of any celebrity that you could have picked from the 80s, like who really one of the biggest names of the 1980s, uh, household names without a shadow of a doubt. And uh, and for him to be just such a, a, a bodacious dude, to be fair, I think. He, um, he's a bodacious dude, yeah. yeah. He's the Don, for sure. <laughs> But for him to have this kind of late career, not just put it out, you know, what celebrities put out mind melting, psychedelic, kind of warped out? Who? I mean, yeah, well, yeah, but here's the thing with, with Steve, um, because, uh, you know, he's, he's very humble and he plays down, you know, he plays down being a musician. But here's the thing Steve has impeccable taste in music and always has had. It's always been really, really into music. So before the snooker thing happened, you know, he was just really, really into music. And he's he's just as good with, you know, stuff that, you know, his, his ears are very attuned to stuff that's like a bit crap even. So he's got really, really good taste in music. And we were doing um, a radio show together. I mean, that's how I ended up in Gong, funnily enough. Was Steve and I were doing a radio show together for about, you know, 10 years. And his ability as, as a collector to just find... Um, all the best new music that was coming out, you know. So he would be turning me on to just album after album of incredible stuff from all over the world. I mean, he's really international ears. He's buying stuff from Japan. He's buying stuff from Norway. He's buying stuff from like you know Ethiopia. He's just constantly buying these wow. current releases, and they're all brilliant. And as we all know, there's so much crap released. You know, yeah. with, with all the intentions of the world, is you know, ninety eight percent of it. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's not really up to us. And he was just find, consistently finding the two percent. You know? Amazing. Um, and so, and I remember being while we were doing like you know like doing the radio show, he'd be lit, he'd he put on say for instance you know a track by Henry Cow or Universe Zero, and oh. be tapping along with these you know really complex sort of polyrhythms, absentmindedly tapping along on his hand with them, and I was thinking. I've played in bands with drummers that can't really get beyond four, four or six, eight. <laughs> you know, you're trying to just show them a basic seven and they can't really feel it. I mean, not thankfully not for a long time, but you know, you know I've, I've been in bands with, you know, and sometimes incredible drummers, but they just can't hear how to play a seven without just going, you know, the right, really right, basic right. seven, right. eight sort of thing. Yeah, so yeah. to watch that, but then also to hear, you know, he'd be in the studio just whistling along with some really big sort of melodic leaps. So big I intervals. thought this, you know, yeah. this guy's, he's got music. He's got, yeah. He's, you know, he, he feels music. So it was no surprise when he moved on to the modular synth. Once he started getting his confidence up, I mean, all I'm saying is all, I don't know what it is that he's doing there, but I know as a performer myself and a, an improviser and a listener, I, there's there's nothing that comes out of his rack that I think oh god I've stopped doing that man you know yeah. the, oh, I wish and <laughs> and the, the truth is I've played with some really really 
extraordinary musicians who are very, very trained and, you know, it's taken years to get there, you know, and, and sometimes you'll be improvising and they just start, and it's like, oh, Jesus Christ, stop, stop now what you're doing, you know, <laughs> stop that incredibly well, it's, you know, incredibly, you know, skillful but horrible sounding noise. <laughs> you don't get that with Steve at all. Oh, so, um, right. yeah, it's, Cause I, and it really, it really sort of made me kind of realise, if I hadn't already, that, you know, the key, I think, to being, a really good musician, um, not a virtuosic musician, but a good musician is taste. Because I mean, there are there are people that you can give them any instrument and they, they'll get something out of it. Yeah, you know, yeah, they'll get and you know they may, they may not be able to master the instrument, but what little they can get out of it will will, will sound really good with whatever it's meant to be over. Taste. You know, yeah. I mean, I think I've always lacked a bit of taste. And, uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because i mean you know I, in fact it was a conversation we were having uh the other day and um about massive attack and um grant daddy g and um and 3d they are non-performing musicians i mean they do sort of vocals live but um they're just taste makers you know they get these musicians to right, come, okay. come in and you know i mean sometimes people kind of whinge a little bit because they go and do a session and then nothing from the session gets used or everything everything from the session gets used and they think that they didn't get paid enough but um yeah yeah but but also it's just the fact that uh well i mean i was doing a so daddy g was around at my studio one time and i was showing him something and i was going yeah yeah because like when you use chords he's going look man i don't know what chords are i said yeah you know what chords are no 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 i don't know <laughs> you know like is a note is a chord all right yeah okay then you say but it was like they so hands off unbelievably hands off from the actual kind of making of stuff yet their taste is incredible and and to actually be able to you know know which combinations work and which things you know which ways to kind of put things together um, I mean, you know, well, good. let's go back to let's go back to um, we were talking earlier about Brian Eno, and I know I know, mm. I know what I'm saying is that is it's kind of a, pretty much a cliche at this point. But if you look at those, well, I think of the the four um, sort of pop Brian Eno albums, yeah. uh, sort of Here Come the Warm Jets, Taking uh, Taking Tiger, Tiger Mountain, Mountain, Another Green World, and yeah. Before and After Before Science. And after Science, yeah. The, the... Or just absolutely, <laughs> you know, I, I can't put a Rizzler paper between those four. They just, yeah. just incredible records yeah made by a self-admitted non-musician and i i, I you know without one and i don't wish to denigrate any sort of art, art form at all but you know i'm not i'm not really one for fusion i mean i can find a few fusion records that i like but you know, these are these are instrument you know musicians that can play the ass off their instruments but i, I really it, it, i don't find it affecting at all m mostly you know and I, I don't wish to I, I don't wish to speak down of any kind of music because all music is good. But I just mean for for the you know trained musician can tell you exactly what chords, which, which which is not to say that it doesn't go the other way. And, and of, of course, you know, of course, I'm not one of these snobs, punk snobs or anything. You know, yeah. of course, people who know exactly what the fuck they're doing <laughs> can also create. You know, John Coltrane or you know having to create just like extraordinary music. Well, Tim Smith, who knew exactly what he was doing, you know, Tim Smith, yes. who could write, who, who wrote everything out from Cardiac. But, so, um, and actually, now, so now you've mentioned the great Tim Smith. I mean, uh, and Cardiacs, of course. Uh, I think it would be good to, well, because one thing I wanted to do through this chat really was to talk about various aspects of your career because it is such an interesting career. You know, obviously now, you know, currently you play in Gong, in Knife World, which is your I would call it large ensemble. For, the octet, yeah, oct yeah. Octet. <laughs> what yeah. we got? And uh, there's, well, there's bass clarinet in there, is it? Or is it a um, bassoon? Uh, bassoon, sorry. Yeah, we have bassoon. used bass clarinet at John Records, yeah. Mm. Um, and well, Knife World has been going for quite a while now. Is that that's probably. Since 2009. Although 2009. It's, been, it's been quite a quiet. When things got busy with the Utopia Strong and Gong, mm -hmm. it's been sort of quiet for the last. Um, Quietish for the last four years, but hopefully after the lockdown, I've, I've been writing a lot more new Knife World music. So ah, so I'm writing Knife World music because then yeah. you've just released a solo album as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hip to the Jag. Hip to the Jag, yeah. Yeah, which Jag is that? Uh, just Jag. It's um, it's you know, if you're on a Jag, 
you know, you're, I'm on a, re- it's like being on a tip, you know, I'm on a real, right. I'm currently gotcha. on a real Daniel Klaus jag. <laughs> All right. Uh, for uh, instance. Cause I was wondering which, so, I thought it might be like hip to the Jaguar XJS, for instance. No, I'm, not, I'm never hip to that. <laughs> Although a friend of mine did send me a photo of Led Zeppelin leaning on a jag and said, these guys are hip to the jag. <laughs> Very so, good. Like, <laughs> so I, I was kind of curious then with that. So Utopia Strong, Gong, Knife World and... Carvas Tarabi. Um, yeah. But also, you do appear on other albums as well. Um, I do appear on other albums. We have uh, a new um, a new thing. Guapo has metamorphosed was, into a new thing called The Holy Family, right. which we, we are just finished. The album is just being uh, mixed and finished. So that you'll be hearing something from that as well soon. So is that Guapo no more then? Is that sort of has Guapo evolved then? I think so, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think oh, oh, it's, it's the same. Lineup. It's the same lineup as, oh, as you know, Guapo had been playing with. So it's, it's a five piece now. Um, David uh, Smith, who's the sort of linchpin, um, Emmett Elvin, Michael J York that we were just talking about, a guy called Sam Warren on bass. That's the universal symbol of bass, as, as well. You know, um, <laughs> Sam Warren and bass, and um, and me on, on on this album, guitar and harmonium. Ah, oh, the harmonium again. Yeah, so, the harmoniums on on this. Yeah. So this is the question I've got then. With so with many so many different kind of creative avenues. Then uh, you said then sort of writing knife world music. Then so. Do you know instinctively then if if you start to develop something, which outlet it's going to be for, or does it have to kind of get uh, further down the line before that becomes apparent um well no it's not um uh it's not so much knowing instinctively it's just like god i mean i can I've, I've i've thought about this a bit each band let's let's take them as five bands let's call it sort of like you say the solo thing gong the utopia strong knife world and um uh, you know what, what's now called the holy family and actually let's add something like Steve Hillage Band and Cardiacs into that as a, as a separate thing because each one has a because a, a, um, obviously yeah Steve Hillage Band although that's um, yeah. but, but each one has a different way of working so the way I'll, I'll write let's start with Gong the way I'll write in Gong is well no, actually that Knife World is the easiest to explain the, with Knife World I kind of hear it's for these kind of big pieces where I can hear the whole I can hear the whole thing. It's, it's it's three horns, keyboards, guitar, two vocals, and with some and drums and bass. And so my actual guitar parts are just one very small part of the picture. You know, you, you need to hear it with the horn arrangements and the keys. And so when I'm writing these big kind of quite expansive, arranged sort of composed pieces, then that's that's kind of what I bring to Knife World. And then that's when I sort of sit down and go, okay, well. This is the idea I've got for the keyboards. I think the keyboard should do this. And I kind of give everybody parts that I know are going to work together. But because they're much better musicians than me, at <laughs> each of their indiv- individual instruments, you know, I'll show him it, what I'd, I'd like the keys to do, and then he'll turn it into something better. He'll, he'll play it like a, a proper keyboard player will do, or no, not, or an idiosyncratic player like Emmett will play it, which, he, which he, has, he has his own very sort of singular style. And then same as when I'm arranging for the horns, I'll show them something, and then between them, they'll go. Well, look, you know, this line would work better if it's actually below the, below the alto sax kind of thing. At the, the moment you've got this, the alto playing that, and then they'll play, and it's like, oh no, no, you're right, that is better. Right. Sort of thing, and and so I can't, and then we we just sort of work it up as a, in a rehearsal. So that's stuff that I kind of write before I get there and give it to them. But with with you know with Gong, for instance, no matter who brings what into Gong. It, it gets worked on by the five of us, and um, and, and everybody's very sort of vocal. So I think you you wouldn't I would I wouldn't want to bring in a completed piece into Gong because I wouldn't want to say to them Look, you, yeah. now this is your part and this is your yeah. So what I, what I tend to come up with in Gong is just stuff you know that we write when we're together in the rehearsals. You know we'll book a week of rehearsals and of course I, I you know in the in the morning you know i'll come in i'll i'll go on the balcony have a smoke and come down and just start, uh how about this riff you know the, the the um forever reoccurring which is that 20 minute piece that takes oh. up side one of yeah uh, that's also collapsed it just started off with this just one riff i came up with in the morning which is just this um you know kind of God, i haven't paid for a while mm-hmm. paid for it so no, it's not all right. <laughs> Ah, oh, 
Well, I'm, it's the lockdown. I'm no, I'm no longer playing my own riffs. So. <laughs> That's the riff. So I just came up with that in rehearsal. And then we started playing it, and then of course everyone writes their own parts on top of that. It starts getting groovy, and it's like, oh, what if I drop out? And then we do. And basically, nice. this that that what starts off as that riff just expanded with all all five of us just into this twenty minute piece. Mm. Um, and that's generally how the gong stuff gets written. And then sometimes people will have a couple of riffs and will play them. Oh, that goes well with that. And so it's you know with with gong stuff. I mean, there are riffs that I'll write which sound really really gongish, and I'll think, okay, that's that's one for gong. But generally, it's you know it's arranged by all of us kind of in a rehearsal and then as it's going I'll have some ideas for melodies and then Cheb the drummer will say will come up with a harmony or say oh what about if you change the melody the second time to this so it's a very very democratic process nice, nice. Um, so that's that one yeah <laughs> uh, but then something like the Utopia Strong well that's just mm. you know, it's a three like three wheels of the vehicle we're all we're all improvising together and responding to each other and so that's completely in the moment. Mm. And, uh, you know, we, we're, you know, we'll back off when somebody seems to be, you know, it's an instinctive thing. You know how it is if somebody seems to be kind of laying down something really vital, then sometimes the other two will back off and let that thing develop and then move in on top. So it's a very kind of, I know that word organic is overused, but very elastic sort of process. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, and and then with the, with the solo stuff, it was just, um, it was just a sort of desire to, to do everything myself and just sort of, is that the guitar? I saved it with my foot. It's all right. Oh, it's it was, not... um, it was, a, you know, it was just wanting to go and just do this stuff myself because what happened is I kind of wanted to, I just wanted to see what it was like to be able to be a gig as a solo performer, mm. which I'd never ever done before two, two years ago. I came to see because you. I just wanted to be able to do gigs largely at the drop of a hat. If people said, oh, well, right. you know. Can you can you play a gig on the you know on the twenty third of September? Just look at the diary and go, yeah, I'm free. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. Rather than having to send out an email to everyone, yeah. book loads of rehearsals. Oh, yeah. then we need a, we need to get a vehicle. Oh, we're going to yeah. get a hotel. Oh, we're going to need this much of a fee just to. So for oh. this, I could go. Look, I, I need this much money, and I need my travel, and I need accommodation. And they said, fine, I, I, I could turn up with an acoustic guitar and a harmonium. Well, I, I, well, the, the harmonium came into. I, you know, I'd never performed alone before, and it took me a while to really find you know, find the correct persona because you can't go on to one of these little intimate gigs with the big psychedelic gong persona. It's, it's a different thing. It's a lot more yeah. kind of just speaking to people directly. Yeah. And the, the it's not so sort of, yeah. And yeah. The, the audience is a different kind of thing. It's a different size of audience. And so because of that, I started writing tunes to perform live. And then I thought, right. oh, well, wouldn't it be nice to record these? So with these ones, I, I kind of recorded the very basic voice and harmonium or voice and guitar and then built up the arrangements on top of that. But then I'm, I'm just as happy to be, if I'm really into the music, yeah. I'm just as happy to be a soldier. And that's why I was in Cardiacs, you know. Right. I'm just there to be, a, I'm just there to serve. Yeah. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know. yeah. I've done... These are the parts, right, I'll play, I'm going to play the shit out of them, you know. <laughs> and the Cardiacs then went, what it was moving towards was more be being a, was write, writing with the new stuff, you know. Hmm. I started to write more and write melodies and lyrics and stuff. But certainly in terms of just being in the band, and this is the same with the Steve Hillage band, I'm here to serve because I because I believe in the music. I'm here to just play the best kind of play these parts the best I can. You know. So I mean, obviously mentioning Steve Hillage there and the Steve Hillage band. So it, Gong were basically the backing band for Steve. Is that right? On the yeah. last tour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. um, I mean, wow, what an honour. I mean, yeah, as it was if, amazing. Yeah. As if you know, playing in Gong isn't as you know <laughs> to do the Hillage thing as well. Um, well, I'd, I'd I'd heard I'd heard you know the the thing with Steve Village, yeah, like it's been such a fan, but we were away. We were starting to get Steve was really really into this, what was really into this current new version of Gong and totally behind it. And whenever he could, he would he would come and just sort of join us on stage or you uh... know do gigs with us. So and it was we we'd done quite a few gigs oh. here and there. Oh, I think I lost you a little bit. Um, the end of two oh. 2000. Hang on, Carvis. I'm just going to... Can you just back up a moment? I think we just lost you just the last sentence. Am I back now? Yeah, Can you hear yeah, me now? Yeah, yeah, good. Or yeah. am I still lost? No, no, good. <laughs> oh, it says poor network. 
um, um, yeah, yeah, no, and then so, uh, Steve just dropped it on us in J- Japan. We, you know, do you, do you guys? I'm thinking of relaunching the Steve Hillage band. Would you guys like to do it? And it's just like t- totally like to do totally it. Yeah. Like, yeah, and that's nice. Then, so you know, the, the fact that you'd already had that sort of playing together, it me, it, it, it was the obvious thing, I suppose, because. I mean, it was a lot of interconnection. I mean, obviously, Steve Hillage was a member of Gong, wasn't he? I mean, um, um, mm-hmm. not just Gong. I mean, he had a very interesting, very, very interesting career. In fact, I would say that Steve Hillage, in terms of guitarists, has had one of the most interesting careers, in, if you look at everything that he's achieved. I mean, because for those of you who don't know Steve Hillage, I mean, Steve Hillage was like the godhead of the British hippies, wasn't he? I mean, he, you know, he... Yeah, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Famously, when uh, Neil's record player gets trashed in the young ones is oh no steve hillage you know that's that's, the first... um, uh, that's, the, that's when i first heard of him me yeah. too me too and then it me neil's, too <laughs> and in neil's book of the dead which came out there was a page yes. homage to hillage homage to hillage i mean yeah well, can, I, can i can i briefly stop you can we can we just do a, a, a quick uh can we just take uh, put a flag in here's an interesting album which for me was absolutely a seminal introduction into loads of psychedelic music was neil's heavy concept album neil's heavy now, neil concept out album. a record around the time of the young ones called neil's heavy concept album <laughs> now on this record well, it was produced by dave stewart right from hatfield in the north and national health and you know, later dave stewart and, and barbara, barbara gaskin. gaskin yeah um and so it had loads of i think loads of sort of like canterbury alumni ah. were playing on this record but on it, um, you know, Neil, Neil, the character Neil played, um, he plays The Gnome by Pink Floyd. He played a very cellular song uh, from, and, sorry, uh, the Amoeba song from very song, incredible string band. He played uh, My White Bicycle by Traffic. <laughs> nice. Um, he uh, played... No, My White, uh, my white golf, Bicycle is tomo- My White Bicycle is Tomorrow. No, tomorrow, sorry, beg your pardon, Tomorrow, yes, of course. Hmm? Yeah, holding my shoe, Traffic, sorry. Um, and um, Golf Girl by Caravan. <sighs> Now this this album ended up girl. being my um, my gateway into well, you know, Sid Barrett and mm. the Canterbury thing and this, this whole thing. So funnily yeah. enough, you know, this was a real gateway album, and, and the comedy <laughs> doesn't really hold up, but the the music still does on that record, I think. Yeah, I mean, I I was really surprised at the time to to know that Hole in My Shoe wasn't written as a comedy song, that it was yeah, actually yeah. Written, that it was a real song. Um, wow. But I mean, like Steve Hillage, uh, his he started playing in the late sixties. I think, kind of, um, gosh, as 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 oh. he was in a band called Khan. And well, Khan, uh, com- oh, as Asriel, uh, uh, is it Asriel? Asriel, as, as, yeah, um, Asriel, Asriel. Yeah, they had yeah. a. They re- he told me they they had a get together recently. A bit of a, uh, um, a, it was an anniversary. Like, was it fifty years or whatever it was? And it was him and Dave Stewart, and I think Chris Cutler was there, and um, yeah. Uh, see, so I really think that Dave Stewart, as in not David A. Stewart, so da- like Eurythmics, Dave Stewart is was always David A. Stewart, right? Uh, okay. And that David A. was to differentiate him from the Dave Stewart, and in in in, in the my Dave Stewart, yes. the Dave Stewart. <laughs> I think Dave Stewart is one of the most underrated keyboard players of all time. I think he is amazing. Not in our house, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, his sense of his sense of harmony and his kind of chordal work is, is so distinct. And the thing that's quite interesting is that you can hear that in his playing right at the start as well. And right, I, yeah. I always find that quite interesting when a musician is almost born fully formed, you know, because um, he was like... Uh, of course, Dave Stewart. Be, he, before he was in Hatfield and North, he was in um, Egg as well. Egg, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. And that that kind of fuzzy organ sound, um, sort of, it's such a great tone. Ah, oh, I think he's amazing. I really do. I love you. Yeah, I do. Me too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Hooray to Dave Stewart. Um, well, in fact, when Steve when Steve first when um, when Steve first mentioned doing this band he was going to ask dave stewart if he's going to be uh, going to be playing keyboards in, in you know the, the wow. new versus steve hillish band which wow. i think did d- d- they very politely declined but for me it was like oh, oh being in a band with dave stewart. Oh, god <laughs> yeah um so um so okay so i mean we've been sort of like zipping all over the place a little bit but i mean for yourself then um you were, was it plymouth that you were, that you grew up in 
I, I grew up in Perth, yeah, I moved there in 1977, yeah. Okay. And then um, became a huge music fan and uh, and at some point became a Cardiacs fan. <laughs> uh, when did you when did you first discover Cardiacs? Um, I was at I was at uh, I, I just left school um, and went you know because I, I I couldn't wait to leave school and be in a band and grow my hair so I left school at sixteen and, and went to carry on at college for, for all the good it did me because I'd already joined a band so <laughs> me too what, what the point? I was only there really to sort of placate my parents um, <laughs> yeah. but I, I met a guy who uh, I got him like an artist guy uh, young guy it was it was kind of really groovy for Plymouth anyway there was a, a very very groovy uh, CFE College of Further Education and all the um, freaks from all the teenage freaks <laughs> went there yeah. uh, because they must have all just not fitted in at school so nice. you realize it was I mean there was there was this one table where all the kind of goths and hippies and punks and and freaks were and this was 1988 it was a really amazing time um you know and for me it was a it was a it was funny at school didn't really didn't I had a nice little gang of friends but it didn't really fit in. So then to go here and find just all these amazing kind of like, uh, like I say, just real radical sort of like just lefties and anarchists and, like you know, real into the sort of gay and lesbian thing and all this stuff that was just not, you, you weren't getting at school. And I met this really cool artist guy who wasn't even at the college, but just used to hang out there because the refectory was just somewhere. I mean, it's it's hard to imagine now with everybody smoking and like music blaring in the refectory and not not bothering showing to lectures and no one would tell you otherwise and getting to grow your hair long and in my case having been to an all boys school just hanging out with really cool girls and uh, there was a, a a guy who I became very good friends with you know and he after about two or three weeks he said look you've got to borrow this and he handed me a little man in a house in the whole oh. world window which had just come out in wow. 1988 yeah. And I said, well, what's it like, you know? And he sort of tried to describe it to me. And it didn't look like, you know, it didn't it didn't look like the kind of red, you know, <laughs> what I was using, just a big white flower on this sort of yeah. grey cover. I took it back to my, you know, where, where I was living with my parents. And I put it on and it was it was instant. It was it, instantly the music I'd been looking for. And I didn't realise it. I mean, it's it's I can't, you know, I could spend the next hour talking about the impact this record had. Yeah. And um my uh my, my cousin grew up Arash grew up with us. And uh, actually two two funny stories because Arash is a total music obsessive as well. Um and our tastes there, there's a small convergence, but generally he, he, you know, we have a few quite a few artists, but you know, it's a different taste. And um but I knew he was he was really, really big and, and really down on just generally independent music, indie music. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, you know, he was an indie band. And he at this point, he was um, doing a foundation course in Hull. And I rang him up and I said, Irish, Irish, if you, I've just got into this band. Have you ever heard of Cardex? And he just said, oh, God. They're like the they're like the indie rush or something, you know. And I, I yeah. thought, really, I, I couldn't hear any of like because you know, I quite like Rush, you know. Couldn't hear any of Rush in there. I didn't know what he meant, but uh, yeah, I know. Mm. But I, I realised that there was, you know, there was that Cardex had a pretty bad, pretty crummy reputation, like certainly with the music press. Yeah, you well, know, John largely hated. John Peel hated them. I, I know. I hate. Hated, yeah. I hate I know, John. Sure. I hate John Peel because of that. I really do. I know. It Peel, put me off him. It put me off him. I thought, how? Although how can... the Cardiac the offshoot band, Seenus, he really liked. He, he and did a, them a session. He did. And a... They did. A, they did. A, Seenus did a radio session with him, having no idea it was basically <laughs> three of Cardiacs. <laughs> I love that. So, I mean, Cardiacs is. It's one of these rare. Well, I mean, incredibly rare. They are truly the most rarest of gifts in many ways. Um. Tim Smith, the great Tim Smith. Um, Tim is still with us, but sadly is very, very ill. Um, so whether, I mean, it's... A, his, his mind is completely with us. His body yes. is his body is us his, his elsewhere, his yeah, body elsewhere is a, but, you know. Yeah, but he's been described by some people as the Mozart of rock music, which is... Right. Which in, on some level sounds like a ludicrous thing. And then when you know... It, when I mean, when you know his music and when you start to understand his very unique perspective and how that manifested in music and also his 
unique ability to attract fantastic musicians as well uh, into the fold. Um, I mean, the music is an uh, is astonishing. It's a multi layered, multifaceted thing. It's it's about everything. It's music that I, for me, for me, Tim's music is. Um, it, it it just it, it it encapsulates life with all its terror and joy yeah. and fear and excitement and exhilaration and crushing misery, <laughs> and Tim Tim gets it all. You know, you'll get bands like you know you you may get into one band that does they they, they do their thing, mm. you know, and that's what they do and that's the mood they generate. And you'll get another band that well that's the thing they do. Tim just seemed I, I think just has taken the, this experience and yet there's something just completely otherworldly about it as well Absolutely. I, I, I just think it's extraordinary I, I don't know i mean it had this it had such an effect on me um, um me too. And, and i can't really even speak about what, what he's doing in, in musical terms i know that he has his own he has his completely his own harmonic language you know that, that he uses it and and that's right from the beginning you know he starts the band in about 77 when he's sort of 16 and right from the get-go i mean he keeps refining it over the years to the point that but, you come in on sing to god yeah it's it's refined to somewhere else, but it, it's right there his, it's, this, this harmonic language he uses he's there from the start completely self sort of he, he yeah. talks about his influences i mean his influences are you know he, he was very big on the man who sold the world uh, he was very into the who and he was really into the clangers music and then things like Henry Cow and Art Bears and, you know, Zappa, but, but none of that. And, and, you know, and, and Sex Pistols and whatever. And then like, but none of which, I mean, you could, you could, you, if, if you've got a good ear, you could make a, some wacky cross between these, sort of, but that's yeah. not what he does. No. You know? It comes Where to, he, he comes, he, you know, he, he's a visionary. You know? Yeah, I think def definitely. A true visionary. The, yeah. the music does come together in something that, that is, wholly unique doesn't it i mean you know to it's almost um it's almost it's almost like a an irrelevance to try and spot the 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 uh, uh the influences i mean yeah you sort of do and in a, a couple of places you, you know you, you kind of notice it but by and large you know it, it, it is it's it is its complete unique voice and that also makes it a little bit difficult for some people to get into. I mean, I've heard. I know, of... and I when I got into them, I thought that was because for me, I thought you know, I heard it, and I thought, oh well, this is this was the point of the Beatles. The point of the Beatles is to birth to prepare us for this. Beatles is <laughs> yeah. Beatles is the, you know, it's yeah. preparing, and now we're here. Yeah. That that was the, Beatles was the demo. Here's the here's the finished thing, you know. Mm. And thought, well, that, obviously this is going to be the obviously once once people hear about this band it's but you know then, then you play it to people and they just couldn't hear yeah they weren't hearing they weren't hearing they were just like turn, it's turn, a, this it's, is awful it's just like a and I, I couldn't i yeah. couldn't couldn't get it it's a strange thing and then yeah. you, know, you realize just because i up, up until that point look, I, I got why slayer wasn't for everyone you know yeah and I kind of got why, you know, God flesh wasn't for everyone. You know, and I got why, you know, you get why, like, you know, the madcap laughs. For some people, they might find it a, a, a really uncomfortable list. I, I got all that, you know, yeah. but with, with Cardiacs, I, I couldn't see why, I, I could, I just couldn't see why people, you know, what what is it you're not hearing in this? But yeah. I get it now. I get why people, <laughs> yeah. when I was 16, it was, uh, it was very different. Oh, I wish I'd have discovered them at 16. I really do. I mean, they just... Well, no, because it, 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 it's because of cardiacs. I'm still living in rented accommodation, you know. <laughs> they, they ruined my chances of, uh, it's, you know, cardiacs totally screwed my chance for any... <laughs> Any sort of a, I was, yeah. I could have been, it could have been a real, good, good, quite successful heavy metal, right? Heavy metal band at this yeah. point, had they not come along, and ruined everything. Oh my goodness, I can totally understand because, I mean, so. I mean, I was explaining to Carvis earlier when we were talking, but I, I, you know, I come into, um, I, I heard a song called "A Dog Like Sparky," uh, which is essential listening for everyone on the planet. I have to say. Place your hand on the Holy Bible and scream wank. <laughs> fiery gun hand. Fact fans. Is that? No. That's, is it? No. That's... Yes, like, place your hand on the Holy Bible and scream wank is, um, it's, uh, it's a dog is like, it? it's dog like Sparky. I'm having an argument with. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but fiery gun hand, fiery gun hand is. Do you know, I was driving to Cardiff one time down the motorway. Of course it is. Sorry, God. 
<laughs> I was driving to Cardiff and Fiery Gun Hand came on and yeah, it was that's it. loud. It is dangerous song to to drive to drive to. Honestly, I started flooring it and I was flooring one off. <laughs> and the guitar solo in Fiery Gun Hand is I think it's some sort of aggregate of lots of guitar solos or something right. yeah, 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 yeah. cut 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 in certain ways to make yeah. it like the most ridiculously thrill thrilling guitar solo and just when yeah, you yeah. think you're at a point of guitar solo this whole kind of little this this tune just <laughs> goes it's extraordinary yeah it's an extraordinary listen yeah so that's um on the the double album sing to god came out in 1995 now this is a different cardiacs in many ways this was the um the 90s version of cardiacs the 80s version was the large ensemble wasn't it you know um in many ways, I think it was in 1990, the uh, Live at the Mayor's Nest is in some ways like a crowning moment of um, Cardiacs, in a way, uh, of the big band, I think. It's always like the, they became like a, a much more leaner four-piece after that. Um, but they had a drummer, a percussionist, Sarah on the saxophone, um, William D. Drake on the keyboards now. Who you have produced? I have. I've produced two albums with Bill, That's... and it is he. I mean, so for me, that was my kind of um, being involved with Cardiacs in some way, thrill. And it is a thrill to be involved in some, to be connected in some way, is a dream and a you know a total thrill. I mean, you know, and and through that, you know, getting to to meet Carvis and uh, Craig from uh, North Sea Radio Orchestra. Which uh, you've been a part member of, haven't you, of North, North Sea? Yeah, Craig played, Craig played bass in um, in Life World as well in the, the ah. first couple of years. Ah, okay, interesting. Um, and I think Craig, um, so Craig Fortnum him, and North North Sea Radio Orchestra, another outstanding act to uh, gosh I tell you what there's some good good tips on today's show uh, no naughty radio orchestra the the catalog all of it is just absolutely top notch um but craig has also got his solo project uh, called arch garrison and i think he's got fact, a um, new album the, the- yeah, they are. I'm putting it out on my label. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes, amazing. I love it. Oh my god, those two albums he, he's released as Arch Garrison are yeah, they're amazing. stunning, yeah. stunning, 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 and I think woefully underrated. I think they are top top draw. In fact, the way I describe North Sea Radio Orchestra and Craig's music in in general as well is um, it's quintessentially English in the best possible way. If that makes sense, you know, it's got this. It's, it's it's almost like this bucolic wonderment of a of of of, of a of, of of something that is uniquely English without it getting um, cloying or nationalistic. I don't what's, know. How... What's the worst possible way? Is if if we take screwdriver as being the worst possible way, <laughs> I guess this is, this is the. <laughs> Mark Radcliffe was in Screwdriver. I know he was, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. shocked. <laughs> but he said before they'd radicalised. Yes, of course, before, before, the, before the message became clear, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, y- you know, um, so this idea, I mean, like I was just mentioning there, um, that North Sea Radio Orchestra, very, you know, this beautiful Englishness about it, which um, I say, that sounds like a horrible thing to kind of say. In no, a way. Well, no, I don't think it does. Not not in a musical sense, no. you know. Yeah. It, it, I, I mean, it's, you know, the mind, I, I, well, yeah. yeah. A lot of my favourite stuff gets called very English, you know, so. Uh, yeah. No, it's good. I mean, and, and, and absolutely. Uh, but, uh, you know, Cardiacs and, um, and actually, Bill Drake, William D. Drake, his solo material as well, is, you know, the the thing that kind of connects, that joins the dots between a lot of these, uh, and I, I think actually most of the music that we've talked about, though, is... Um, is it and is is like some sort of inner confidence of this world, this musical kind of vision, this... Uh, and, I mean... I was talking quite a lot about Magma in uh, the show with Steve, obviously. Uh, and Magma are another band who this would apply to. And I actually think my band Rocket Gold Star it applies to, although we haven't had anywhere near the success. But, you know, having a something, you know, um, 
yeah, you said like a vision, but it's almost like philosophy. Um, some things work within that, and some things don't work. It's 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 a uh, it's a really peculiar thing. I love it. I mean, I love it. I'm always looking for bands that give me this sense that they've created their own universe, their own uh, you know, their own texture, their own feeling, something that is entirely unique i mean you mentioned rush and i i have to admit when i was a youngster when i was 16 i was utterly obsessed with rush utterly for for 16 17 18 utterly obsessed and geddy was my man you know i'm bass player okay. and, you know uh and also i loved the synths that rush were using on those especially around moving pictures and signals fantastic album by rush uh Again, you know, you sort of read. I then was told to be ashamed of liking Rush when I, you know, it's about like 20, 21. People, I gave. I was told I, to be ashamed. <laughs> a great song title. I, I'm really, I'm really upset with my younger self for actually kind of, you know, like dance music had just taken over early 90s, totally was dominating. Bands were more or less finished, it seemed. I mean, grunge kind of brought it back a bit and then Britpop. But 1991, 1992, you know, bands were as we'd known it. And like I'd, I'd, I'd grown up, I'd always wanted to be in like, you know, super tight band riffing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then no one was interested. Everyone just wanted to rave. <laughs> um, and it felt to me like in, in fact i think it was a really fertile time the early 90s in britain um but i was looking for something i was looking for bands who could like people were saying ah oh, prog rock is utter shite you know it's it's an aber aberration it should never have happened and i was going but i love that music it really meant a lot to me again this thing i'm not being particularly <laughs> eloquent of articulating this sense of their own universe that they you know bands not but just didn't you think um, yeah but i mean didn't you think that was as much going on in, in with the rave scene there was i mean i think at any at any given point um just to just to steer things off a little i hope i'm so not trampling over the point you were, no, no. you were making but at any given point i mean that there are always people making just thoroughly captivating brilliant and transformative music and i don't think yes. any single genre uh, or any single style can has exclusivity over that. And I mean, yeah. the thing is, you're going to have if you're going to be if you're born as an artist and a visionary, then you're going to make your art out of the tools that are available to you. Now, if the only the only tools that are available to you are sort of like you, you've grown up in a jazz world, then you're going to be making, you know, you're going to be making your visionary. You're, you're making visionary jazz. But that's what's going to be. That's what's going to separate your, the Sun Ra from the Kenny G's, you know. <laughs> to take two really obvious examples, right? But what I mean is, it's like when you when you you'll get people, oh, oh, I hate heavy metal. They say, yeah. what? what Slayer? What you hate Slayer? How how can you call Slayer as a visionary band? You know what you talking about? Oh, you, oh, it's just like, because because if you if you can hear the visionary stuff, regardless of where it's come from, you, the visionaries will. You, so I'm just. So really, I'm interested in the visionaries uh, and, and and making the visionaries, and they can. I've yet to hear any one genre that can claim credit for um credit credit for that. Right. And, and I've got to say, with the with the with the um, I, I don't want to bad mouth prog rock in any way, but yes, there, there's a handful of interesting bands, but there's just so much horrible, horrible, horrible yeah. shit. Oh, in horrible! There, as with all yeah. kinds of music, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. As as with with all sorts of music, yeah. I really don't hear. I mean, you know. I, I I have yet to just keep repeating myself. There there is genius stuff in it. You know there is genius stuff, and there are only people working with the tools that they've got. And if you've grown up in a, if you've grown up in you know Chicago in the early eighties, there's no reason. You know, in urban Chicago, there's no reason you would be making Canterbury-style music. You know, there's no reason you would be making music that sounded like, you know, Hatfield in the North. Oh, Nor is there any reason why, if you were growing up around yeah. Canterbury in the sort of in the mid '60s, would yeah. there be any reason that you would be necessarily wanting to, to make sort of rockabilly? Right. You know, because of the, the but which isn't to say that there aren't, you know, there isn't genius rockabilly stuff. I, I really think it's about trying to find. The vision reason, I, and I, so I, I feel lucky to have at least. But I think this is perhaps this is one of the things that 
Okay, this is a real sweeping statement I'm going to make here. Make it. But I think this is this is kind of one of the things that separates people who are fans from people from say musicians who who want who just love because I love music. Music is a language, and music is a, a, you know it's it's like they say it's like liquid architecture. But but music, it's for me, music is magic. Yeah. And when correct, it lights up a circuit. It's you know, thoroughly psychedelic, and it lights up a kind of circuit in the brain that that can't be lit otherwise. Yeah. And I, yeah. there's no telling what's going to light that, what, what's going to really light that circuit. I mean, you go, oh, dude, oh Jesus Christ, you know. <laughs> right. I, I, I'd heard a lot of, I'd heard a lot of classical music uh, at school that just didn't do it for me. And it wasn't until, and this is the real corny, cliched album, but it wasn't until I heard the Rite of Spring. Yeah. I heard, learned, I heard orchestral music. Yeah. Like I heard rock music, yeah. Because I heard and it had that same visceral, yeah. Kind of the right of spring that same album. kind of visceral bu buzz that hearing, you know, hearing something like the Sex Pistols for the first time, or hearing nice. the Iron Maiden for the first time. It's just like, oh god! And I heard it like a rock record, and I was singing along with it like it was a rock record. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's actually fire, but you know. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, and it's mm. it's just kind of like. Okay, well that 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 one that makes that circuit light up, and so you're looking for stuff that does that. And um, I I thought that there was you know when the elect, I mean, talking about our our ages, and so I grew up in you know I came online um with music in 1980, and so anything just anything that was going on in the charts just sounded like you know pop music to me was great. And yeah. It was a really exciting, expansive time. Yeah. So I've never I've never really gravitated towards anything like a particular genre. I mean, I've got, obviously, psychedelic, I've got the guitar, and I make psychedelic music, and, and but I've never really felt I wanted to be part of a genre, and I felt I, I always yeah. had more of a kind of language that would translate to anything. I think if I was to, if I was to move into the modular world, it would still sound like <laughs> my stuff. It would sound like my yeah. world, but we're just with the... That, that almost like it's almost like the timbre yeah. of the music is irrelevant. It's what the music saying. You know? Yeah, well, it's what it's, it's saying. It's important to me. Amazing. So I mean, you know, um, so when we're talking about the, the early nineties, I was talking about bands being kind of almost, you know, it, it, more than any time that I've ever remembered, uh, kind of almost irrelevant. You know, and electronic See, well, music. That's weird because I growing up in Plymouth was. Yeah. That wasn't the case at all, you know. I know in the early nineties was when yeah. things went, went just down the road from the road in Bristol in Plymouth. There was a, a really cool, really really cool music scene in the early in the early nineties. Right. So you know, we, we didn't get much further than Exeter, but you know, we so. had a bit of a thing going on sort of around Swansea uh, in the early nineties and Neath um, of all places. Uh, but yeah, it didn't really go beyond that f much beyond that. But um, I, I think the point I was trying to get to though is. I actually, I started realizing that the things that I was looking for, I was kind of finding in electronic, some electronic music, you know, like um, Future Sound of London. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, future guest coming up as well. I am um, Gaz Cobain. Uh, is going to be on the show. The, the other Cobain. The other, the other rock. Well, the other. Yeah, and the other Gaz as well. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but um, he, uh, well, he's amazing. So that, that that's going to be an interesting one. But uh, also, you know. The Orb, my goodness! Yeah, and yeah. This is my pastor, Steve Hillage, really. Um, well, of course, yeah. He still he plays on the new record. Him and <sighs> that's fantastic. And then I got that System Seven album. So Steve Hillage and his wonderful partner, Miguel Girardi, uh, Girardi, Girardi. How do you say? Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Yeah. Girardi, yeah. And um, oh, she's wonderful. She is one of them. She is super cool. And the two she, of them. She sure is. Yeah. Oh, she is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and. Uh, they're adorable as a couple, those two. I love them. They, uh, they really are. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and they've been together for a long time through thick and thin, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, so Steve Hillage, talking about him and, like, you know, playing all this wonderful stuff during the 1970s. But very forward-thinking man. In the 1980s, a lot of people don't realise all the big hit albums, like Simple Minds and all the things he was producing in, this, in the um, 80s. Can you can you dig it? The Mock Turtles was his. <laughs> ah, no. whose brother? Who his Steve his Coogan's brother? Yeah, yeah. Go on. <laughs> what did you say? Steve Coogan. Oh, you brother. knew it. Steve Coogan's yeah. brother. Oh, that, well, that, I just that found one. out the other day how much stuff the bass player from um, Gong, Mike Howlett, how many tracks he produced. All those Echo OMB Beach. Tunes, Echo Beach. You know, the gay souvenir. That yeah, was, he's oh. massive. So so oh, Mike how's... was the. 
Mike was the yeah, bass player. I didn't realize. Sorry. You cut, I, I was cutting in on you there. Mike Howlett was the bass player of Gong for some, well, for the the, the kind of the, the 70s, the, the Flying Teapot. I oh, don't think he's on Flying Teapot, is he? And But he's on from... He's on, I think he's on, I can't. Angel's Egg. Angel's Egg. <laughs> <you. laughs> um, but Mike, yeah, went on to be a, 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 a pop producer. Echo Beach, I mean, what a... That what was a, his, wasn't it? Martha yeah, and Muffin. Martha yeah, and Muffin. Course, yeah. But before this, I mean, there's a really interesting story. Mike Howlett, after he left Gong, he put a band together called Strontium 90 and he got a yep. drummer... A, he got in a guy who... Because, like, Mike's a bass player, but he's brought in another bass player who's going to do some singing and a guitarist. It, the drummer was Stuart Copeland, the guitarist was Andy Summers, and this bass player singer was Sting. So the first time they ever played together... Mike Howlett put the police together. Put the police together at a gig in Paris, a gong reunion gig. They were the, they were playing on the bill. And uh, I, it's just a really interesting little kind of nugget, I think, um, of in history. Because... Um, because Andy Summers is the kind of link there. Well, actually, Stuart Copeland was drumming with Curved Air, wasn't he? Which were one of the more sort of esoteric of the prog bands. Um, but Steve Hillage then, after this, you know, producing like lots of great hits and uh, hit albums, he produced the Charlatans, didn't he? The Charlatans' second album, right, was yeah. it? I think, uh, yeah. you know, so he was staying very, very relevant. Um, but his his act then, System 7... Was um, they did an album called Seven Seven Seven? I think it came out in ninety three. Uh, what was wonderful about that album was it was um, a techno album that had this beautiful musicality to it. A lot of the early rave stuff, it was all really exciting, but musically was just kind of it wasn't really fully formed. It was just more just like noise. So, uh, go, 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 you know, that's, that's, what, that's, that's what I liked. <laughs> yeah. um, but I mean, it was, I mean, it was just like this, this new bubbling sort of genre. And a lot of the people who were making it didn't have a clue what they were doing. They were just necking loads of sp sort of like speed and acid and ecstasy that, if they could find it. Right they were. That's how, that's how any great musical scene is born. And you know, and the, you know what? We need a new drug because yeah. until we get yeah. until we get a new drug, we're not going to get Have any new, new music. New music, yeah. Basically, every fucking important musical, you know, for better or worse, every important musical um, genre has been born out of the, a new drug becoming available. Becoming available, available. yeah. And until we we need we need some kind of new drug, man. Yeah. You yeah. Know, I mean, obviously we we, we haven't. Had really good ketamine music. Really, this <laughs> it's you know, too too much I'm, too so much I'm cocaine. Make the Poppers album. I've been, <laughs> Poppers. I've been promising the Ammo album, and each track is going to be sort of like thirty-five seconds yeah. long, and it's going to go like. <laughs> Just like the Popper Rush. Yeah. Yeah, the Poppers album, man. <laughs> I reckon there's too much cocaine around, you see. I think note to, note I, to self. Yeah, note Pops, to self. Poppers. Ammo album. I think cocaine cocaine is the great kind of music killer, I always yep, think. Except except oh. the exception to the rule Black Sabbath. Oh, you, do you think they made good stuff under co on Coke then? Uh, any questions about volume four? Is that a coked up album then? Ozzy Osbourne says when he listens to listening, but oh man, you need to read I Am Ozzy. Oh no, I've Ozzy not, says yeah. that when, when he now lists, when, when every time he hears Volume Four, it's like pouring cocaine into his ears. <laughs> <laughs> was that that was the yeah yeah okay. bloody interesting yeah. yeah. So um, yes, but I think it's it's one of those things though because it's a, it's an ego booster, you know. And really, bands, I've always thought, like, you know, your band members are kind of ego, you know, and meant to knock your egos down, aren't they? You know, you're meant to kind of level off and sort of, uh, you know. And cocaine is the drug that gives people a sense of actually having done something, having actually done nothing other than sp I, um, spending... I produced, I produced a very good band um, who, uh, uh, who were very partial to cocaine. Okay. And what, what, whatever... Um, Whenever the coke came out, you could pretty much draw a line under the session for that day. Whatever ideas they had <laughs> after the coke had come out were always crap. Interesting. <laughs> it's like, oh, hang on a minute. I'm listening back the following day. Hang on a minute. Oh, yeah, that's when the coke came out, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah this that's, sounds fucking rubbish. That's yeah. when it went rubbish. <laughs> yeah, cool. So, um, okay, so I was like kind of just moving up through the 90s and I, I had a reason for this. So, like, so like early 90s and then. Um, I formed a band which was, 
I guess because I was like part of the, you know, I got into the rave scene. Uh, I had a little sound system as well. So I was kind of, um, you know, I was. What, what uses a little sound system, man? Oh, little. It was little. It was about 1K. You know, it was just a, it was a power ramp and a, a couple of subs. And, um, but, you know, I was, you know, not, not an awful lot, but I was getting involved in some, in the party scene. And, um, you know, I, and I think, you know, this is what made things like the Orb and System 7 and Future Sound of London and, oh gosh, a whole bunch of others really appealing to me was that, uh, I, the chill out. The, when the chill out tent, <laughs> when when they started putting up a chill out tent, that's where I would be. Uh, <laughs> um, and I really liked it. It was like, oh, this is actually reminding me of um, like a lot of the kind of like Tangerine Dream and things. So you know, I discovered some other things and Gong actually as well. And it, it, um like some of the trancey elements of gong uh and so when i heard system seven 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 it's sort of like wow it's like the future but it's also acknowledging the past and it's something that i you know only someone well only steve and Miguette could have made that album because i think it's so infused with their own journey um you know i don't you wouldn't have stumbled upon that you'd you know i think it's uh and, and i thought it was amazing it really because I, I was get, I was having a, I was really getting fed up of a lot of the stuff that was happening musically, and drum and bass hadn't happened just yet, it, and uh, it was just just starting to happen, and also that whole kind of Mowax scene, you know, which I suppose merged into trip hop and whatever, but all of this stuff was happening. Um, but my love, my... actually, we were, I was very lucky to um, I moved up to London in '93. Um, and then sort of moved in later, and then we moved to Hackney in 94. And this is when, you know, the, the drum and bass thing was really happening. So I felt that I, I missed uh, a little uh, on the rave on, on the on the rave scene, because Plymouth was a big, big rave. And the, as I talked about, my cousin Arash was really into rave. My little brother, Bobak, was really into rave. And I went to a, I went to a few raves. I never, you know, I was, I was pretty entry level with that stuff. You know, I liked the Orb, and I liked Orbital. And um, and then I sort of went down that that kind of rabbit hole of like the re reflex stuff and like mm. you know Apex Twin and then obviously like Square Pusher and stuff like Silob and what have you. But then it was really cool to come up to London and kind of be able to get in more with the drum and bass stuff on the uh, as, as it was happening kind of thing. And it was like Omni Trio. Do you remember like the, the movie Amazing. Shadows record? Really? And I remember hearing I, I I hadn't got it. And then I I, I remember hearing tri I was tripping and hearing. Um, uh, 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 what's it called? Ghost, um, ghost of these, uh, 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 Omni Trails, and I just heard it properly. It's like, okay, yeah, I get it. Get it. I've got it now. Yeah. You know, and it was, a, you know, it's just such a lovely. I mean, they talk about, you know, talk about the whole musicality side of it. I thought that was really, if rave was punk, then uh, the, the drum and bass was like the post punk. That's when the, yeah. the it became really, really musical and started yeah. taking real big jazz influences. Yeah, yeah. And uh, not, not that I had a problem with if you want to call it the non-musicality or just the kind of in intensity of the rave because that's what I really liked about it just the, the, just that intense kind of yeah. met metamorphosing just punishment you know, but... <laughs> well I think though you see everything just started to blow open then I think that 93 was the key year that was an amazing year for me 93 uh, yeah that was the year I moved to London uh, yeah I was 21 what a year, year. Yeah. what a year um yeah, I think so was I. <laughs> um, yeah. I think Are you was... a child of 71? No, I'm 72. Yeah. Oh, is that... Oh, yeah. Yeah. What so month? The beard is... Uh, the beard sort of always ages me more than... Uh, everyone thinks I'm much older than I am. Um... I thought you were much older than I am. <laughs> Hard so luck. Turns out I was wrong. <laughs> Why are people always disappointed when you find out they're older than me? <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, 93 was an amazing year because I felt that... that I felt that that's when so rave had become very kind of like um you know it was a real anti-establishment movement you know yeah yeah, totally, uh, yeah. but it felt like it it felt like that that the only music that worked within it had to sort of conform to sort of certain ravey things you know and it was like that was like rave music and then by 93 the idea of a, like an all night party and with a bunch of tents in a field and got you know it, it other music was kind of starting to happen and it was really exciting. And then flipping Oasis came along, didn't they? I'm... Oh yeah, that was a funny time. That that was that was a bit weird. Um 
because I, I've, I've since sort of softened on them, but um, it just sounded so at the, at the time. Mm. It just it. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't wish to speak bad about anyone, but I mean, you know, did, I, like I said, I've, I've softened them, and actually, because don't mind a, a couple of their songs, but what what sort of really kind of uh, got sort of got to me at the time is it just seemed so regressive. It seemed like yeah. the, kind of the sort of music your parents would like. Well, not my parents; they don't perceive like music, but the, yeah. the sort of music that people's parents would like. And it just seemed there was so much oh. exciting stuff coming out, and, and in rock music, there was this really exciting music coming out, and certainly in London. The, the scene because my band, the Monsoon Bassoon, were really kind of that's, that's getting together in London at this point this, and, and start, started, really, you know, getting beginning to release singles. And I think there was a pretty wigged out band, a pretty forward looking band. And then that that the biggest rock rock group in England was this really old man sounding group, yeah. you know. And I just thought, oh, really, with the same old cowboy chords, CG and Ian, it's like. Honestly, or is this is this where we're going? You know, this. Oh, I'm so but, disappointed. But, but they, it, oh. it, time, times have changed, and you know, it, it was it was again like 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 you say, it was more the fact that things felt so much more in, in terms of yeah, music. It, things felt tribal, and it felt like it felt like Oasis was about more than just the tunes. It was about this return to. This return, I don't know what it was a return to because it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, it, was, it wasn't something. It felt a bit blokey. It was all a bit so beery blokey. And a beer bit, it was a, and I was, the rise of of people drinking beer bottles. You know, drinking from yeah. a from a small three thirty mil bottle. You know, it's inextricably linked with the array, with Oasis and Loaded magazine and all that kind I know, of stuff. Yeah. I mean, the Loaded thing was was so weird because. Um, you know, growing up in the 80s, as I did, and being, you know, being very aware of kind of radical politics and bands and, and just like underground bands that all seem to have this kind of radical kind of no sexist bullshit, no homophobia, all the, the standard kind of things. And you just did sort of didn't get that. And in the scene that I was in, whether it was sort of with the whole cardiacs lot or just the scene that I was in in Plymouth was all a very kind of anarcho, you know, hippie ish hippie punk groovy right on scene and then to see this return to like loaded and lads magazines it was like oh, ah, yeah we're yeah. really go we're really going there now you know <laughs> yeah. it was it was a strange time yeah but then we were we were very much in a uh, you know a, around by this point that that was going on i was in london and pals with cardiacs and part of this scene and we we had our own funny little hedonistic bubble <laughs> that was that seemed to be a, a, a part from that kind of a <laughs> Well, anyway. so you mentioned Monsoon Bassoon, and that was kind of my that was my cunning ploy actually to go into the nineties, oh, okay. <laughs> into the nineteen nineties, because you know my band Rocket Gold Star, who actually, so Frank, who's the guitarist and keyboard player, he was part of Reflex. He was a uh, music with Mike Paradinas. Oh right, yes, so, and uh, Mike Paradinas releases uh, my friend, incredible composer Chris. Well, you, has put out the Gas Man. Oh, the Gas Man, yeah, 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 yeah. He's put stuff out on that on uh, yeah. you know. Quite nice. a few of his albums. Used is that, to be pla on that planet, table. planet Mew? Um, yeah, yeah, except Planet Mew. Yeah, yeah. So Frank and Mike, the first music album, which is called Tango and Vective, was. Um, people tend to think of it as just Mike Paradinas, but it was a duo. And in the second, right, okay, no, the I didn't know that actually. Yeah. And the second album as well. There's a few tracks that Frank was on as well. But he, at that time, he'd moved to uh, to do, to college in South Wales, and that's when I met him and um, persuaded him to join a band. And just as the music stuff was really taking off, and uh, I feel a bit guilty when I think about it now, <laughs> how I, how I, how I, how I talk. Raven, Raven, my part, and it's down for by <laughs> yeah. Chris Williams. Yeah. Um, but Frank really is probably still is probably the most influential person I've ever met, really, because he was very clued into a lot of the Aphex and uh, a lot of Aphex Twin type stuff, and but also just a completely radical way of thinking about stuff, um, and and. I was really quite dumb and simplistic, I suppose, comparatively. Um, so ever so grateful to Frank, really. And, and we're still, we are still working together as now, so since 93. So long, long, long time now. Um, but we've got, we've got some stuff going to be coming out soon. I mean, I thought it was going to be coming out much sooner, but it's going to be coming out. <laughs> um, but that's Rocket Goldstar. But the reason why I mentioned that, Rocket Goldstar, was because, you know, I was looking for, bands who were kind of of a similar ilk or a similar with a similar thing i mean and um and w after discovering cardiacs that was 
amazing for me. I mean, it was, I'd say, they, they brought an album out in 1995. It's called Sing to God. It's parts one and two. If I think it's a a towering, amazing piece of work. It's inc- <laughs> I think it's one of the most visionary, incredible. I, I this is my challenge for the listeners out there, viewers. What, what are you? Are they listeners? I've, I've viewers? still got any listeners at this point. I mean, is we it got just 100, me? Talk- 110, I think, in the YouTube. 110 uh, damn fine people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm so sorry. This has been. A- out thinking, when, 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 when's this prick going to show up and start <laughs> going about Roger the Sins again? <laughs> Um, oh man, I mean, I've been keeping a bit of a track on the uh, on the uh, on the chat room, and I will be reading it all in full later. And well, there we go. As your head is is listing Underworld, Left Field, The Orb, Future Sound of London, Global Com, uh, HIA. What's that? I'm missing. Asio that. head is that like switch Asio driver? <laughs> yeah. Okay. He is the ultimate in switching the Asio driver. Plaid. Right, is it? Yeah. Plaid. Fantastic. Plaid, of course. Plaid. You know, Black dog. Yeah, Black Dog, Amon Tobin, who I've been listening yes. to. He he did an album uh, about two Amon years Tobin, ago. Who I believe, yeah, may, used to have played a cardiac track. He used to open a rave with, um, have I got this right? Uh, with Home of Fadeless Splendor. Oh, really? I think I think there's I think I think there may be uh, Amon Tobin cardiac tracks. I think I might be wrong, but um. Um, but he's done an album fairly recently where he's made it entirely from a Suzuki Omnicord and a broken one at that as oh, well. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, Amazing. instant cardiacs, those things. Yeah. Talking about that. Instant yeah, they're cardiacs. beautiful machines, yeah. yeah. And then it's, like, it's like a kind of like, um, it's like a, um, uh, what do you call it? A harp, isn't it? What do you call it? An auto, auto harp. harp. Yeah. Like an electric auto harp, yeah. yeah. Beautiful, beautiful machines, yeah. Oh, HIS, high, high, Higher Intelligence Agency. Wouldn't that be H I A? Oh, actually, have you ever seen these things? Cord cord bots. I have not. So what you can do with the cord bot is quite cool because is it like a glorified VL tone? Is that? <laughs> it looks a bit like, but no, it's yeah, just sure. a it's just a MIDI controller. But basically, it's kind of got its influence from um, you know some of the old keyboards and binary tones and things that had the chords. Uh, I don't know. It would probably. Uh, on the left, these little, these little, oh, here. <laughs> the, 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 let, me, let me let me play with it. <laughs> but basically, yeah. you can create you can create complex chords and save them to these twelve pads. And then when you hold a pad down, you've got like a strum strip there, so you can do um, you can do a lot of arpeggios and arpeggio, stuff. Yeah, and you can just rush run run your finger over this, holding down your different chords, and um, yeah, and get like an omni chordy kind of thing. Uh, which is pretty cool. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's because you can swipe up and down and up and down and, you know, and it's really nice. And as you change the chords, it's a very, very musical and really pleasing thing to do. Um, can you can you, um, can you, uh, can you uh, email me the name of that or something or remind me after yeah, this? That's very link. nice. Yeah, yeah, chord bot. It's a very simple thing. It doesn't make chord any... Bot, right? okay. Yeah, it makes no sound. So it is just a MIDI controller. But, you know, so you can plug it into whatever MIDI device or the, or, or USB and just use it. So, um, uh, but, yes, so I was mentioning that then with, with Cardiacs. It was suddenly... I, I was at a gig and we, we were in the sound check. Sorry, Carvis. Carvis is hearing the story twice. Um, and the song Dog Like Sparky came on over the PA really loud because they were test- setting up the PA. And I... I was gobsmacked. I mean, I was gobsmacked. And I was also a little bit crestfallen as well, slightly, in that something that I was compelled to make, you know, they'd already done it. It was some. I felt like I was on some sort of path to make music a bit like And then it's like, oh, they've all... <laughs> oh, they got there, yeah. They've yeah. got there. They've got there. And not only have they got there, they've really got there, you know. They are there. Um, and then I was trying to... And it was really hard to find albums, Cardiacs albums. They were such a... You just never saw... It, they wouldn't be written about anywhere. They were like... I started to realise that this is, and I absolutely 100% believe this, Britain's greatest underground cult, genuine underground cult band of all time. You know, the biggest unknown band of all time. You know, I still can't believe that people haven't heard of them. When they, you know, I still can't. I think, what? How can you not know this band is so important? Has been you know, so that, influential. You, you only hear 
it, it's only the it's only the connections you make. I mean, there's just as we know, as we know, there's there's so much music out there. And unless you know someone who knows someone that's going to turn you on to it, that, I mean, I, I was so generous, so lucky to have met this, uh, uh, met this guy, Marcus, when I was 16. And for him just to go, I mean, yeah. And record, you, you know, and for him to just go, look, I think you're really going to dig this and, and give it to me. So, I, I mean, who knows if I would have, if, if I would have come to them, um, another way or not, but, um, yeah, I, so, yeah, and it, but, you you only you know when it is and of course Cardiac hasn't been a going concern now for twelve years but uh gosh oh it's I mean that's the thing uh, so <laughs> so uh, it was about like ninety I think so Cardiac I think it was probably about late nineties when I finally found Sing to God a double CD in the record shop bought it came back and listened to it from beginning to end with headphones on twice and it's a double album so. You know, I've never really done that before <laughs> since such a I was rooted to the spot and it was an amazing experience to listen to. And I then became, you know, a rabid fan. And there's no other type. You, you don't you don't you don't meet people who quite <laughs> like it. It's like the fall is the other one. Yeah. I'm the guy. Do you know what? I'm the guy who quite likes the fall. Do you like the fall? <laughs> yeah, I quite like him. Yeah, you, you don't. People yeah. are just like totally into them or they're yeah. just so do you, do you know what I mean but do you, yeah. do you like cardiacs yeah they're quite good yeah I'm quite into them yeah, yeah I've got a no, couple of them. you know no, you don't get them no. It's 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 usually one or the other I mean and yeah. there was one guy in Cardiff you know and he was just like no no they are no that's like like you know i know there shouldn't be any rules but they have broken them and they and they shouldn't you know he was really they, they get they get up people's noses yeah uh, uh, yeah you know. totally but, and then, <laughs> so this is my long story, you see. So after becoming really obsessed with them, I was thinking there must be more things like this. There must be, they, you know, this can't be just, I mean, <laughs> there isn't really, but I discovered the monsoon bassoon. Oh, right. See. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I thought it was brilliant because it was clearly, you know, drinking from the same well or, you know, it was, uh, it was... It was vibrant and exciting and unpredictable and like uh, and I and I think um, I don't know if Guapo. How long have Guapo been making records? A, a long time, about as long as they they started a similar sort of time as the Monsoon Bassoon because yeah. we used to play gigs together in the sort of uh, to, to late mid to late nineties in yeah. London, and right. they used to be a two piece. So I heard some guapo. I ended up joining them. <laughs> up joining them as well, but yeah, joining them. yeah. Um, so that's so. Then you know, you know, monsoon. So I suppose then that's when you became. That's when you were. Although I wasn't. I don't think I'd known your name at that point. But that's when you were essentially first on my radar. Then yeah, was... we well the NME got behind. Funny enough, the the, the cardiac hating NME got really behind <laughs> us. Um, <clears throat> and we had, we had three singles of the week in a row. Which is pretty insane, but um, uh, yeah, yeah, we, you know, that was a, a real good time. In fact, monsoons has been very much on my mind uh, in this last week during lockdown because um, we're going to re-release, <clears throat> we're going to re-release our album from our debut album from '99. I dig Amazing. your food. Amazing. Oh, my camera. Oh, yeah, oh, your camera. I've been really good at trying to. Oh, there you go. It, um, it cuts off every yeah. half hour. <laughs> My There's regulars. been a lot of people have been asking, you know, that <clears throat> the album, the CD uh, back in the days, you know, a few years ago, the CD was going on uh, eBay for like 70, 80, 70 or 80 quid. Oh, hey, go on. Or, or I think 130. Wow. But, um, uh, um, da -da, where was I with that? Yeah. And, and so a few people have been asking, well, are you going to put, are you going to put that album out again? But um, the, the thing is, it, it's, it's about three weeks work. Yeah. I think they do getting remastered but just to, to do all the artwork because we have to redo the artwork do all the basically it, it, i'd worked out it's about three weeks work to put it out well that that's sort of three weeks i would rather be spent writing new music new. or recording new music yeah. you know so I, I, and as, as much as i love the monsoons it's like the like with really with the putting out the record is the boring part that's like an office job <laughs> yeah you know, the, the interesting part is making the, the making record, the writing the writing the music yeah. And uh, whether it's with other people or yourself, but writing it and creating it and <laughs> sculpting it and making it this, making it stand up properly. And then once you've done that, then you've just got to have an office job for a couple of months. Oh, and I'm going to do 
in, you know, it, it, I love doing this, of course, but you know, the, the interviews you have to do, online interviews and doing the PR and, the, and just that kind of stuff, it's really, really boring. Mm. But you're still really excited about it because, you know, it's leading to people hearing your new record. Yes. Well, that record now. Mm. And I know that people like it. And it's like, oh, now I just want to <sighs> have to spend three weeks just. But now that the lockdown's happened and now I'm unable to do gigs and unable to do anything, I got back in touch with everyone in the band and was like, look, should we do this now? And they're, ah. they're totally up. Okay. Um, and then we, we have another at least a, a, a double album a, on once we've done that we have a double album's worth of rarities b-sides some really interesting recordings we did a recording with that guy paul epworth who's now become oh, yeah. well adele and yeah but this is very, very one of his first production jobs we did five tracks with him which never came out and um, we had a load of more stuff that we recorded with tim smith that which either came out as b-sides or or not yet came out what? and then some funny eps um, and what have you. So um, we've got another album after I Dig Your Voodoo. We've got another double album's worth. And then if people are still interested, beyond that, we have loads of interesting radio sessions. We do loads of stuff at XFM, which also XFM had just started. So we're very lucky. Yeah. Uh, there's a DJ called John Kennedy. Got really yeah, behind I remember John. Yep. And he gave us like sort of his midnight mover. And then he, they did a whole gig of ours. They broadcast it because XFM was far more experimental then. I don't mean yeah. necessarily. We did a we did a live session on there as well. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. The, it wasn't it wasn't the kind of generic it, it sort of la, you mm. know skinny skinny without wanting to get identitarian at all. But you know what I mean, skinny <laughs> yeah. white guy, skinny jeans, white guy, guitar guitar music sort of thing. That it well, I don't know what it is because it's over now. But you know, <laughs> it became a lot more conservative. But mm. at the beginning, it was it was really kind of. Um, it wasn't exactly Resonance FM, but there was. It was just generally into. There was loads of really. I mean, the London scene round then was. I'm, I'm going, but there was stuff like Add Into X oh, and brilliant. Um, you know, this band called Nub, and it was just loads of extremely cool bands uh, around London and um, and and the UK. You know, yeah. and XFM seemed to be picking up on that. It's, it, it had, I mean, Ricky Gervais had an early show. On there, and in fact, he compared a show that we a monsoon show we did. <laughs> no way. That time. Borderline, yeah. Fly me. Oh, the borderline. It's gone now, isn't it? It's just closed. Borderline. I has think. It? I think has it last year. No, maybe? not the borderline. Sorry, I meant the underworld. Yeah, the borderline has closed. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah. No, sorry. sorry, the underworld. The yeah. underworld. Yeah. So the two places with, uh, you've got one as well, Fleece and Firkin, with a post yeah. in the middle of the stage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. I've been behind that post many a time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, Cavs, I think I'm going to probably wrap because we, uh, wrap we, we're going we'll on. I mean, uh, <laughs> we could go on and on. So, I think what we'll probably do, though, if you would be so kind, is to join me in a future episode. Um, and because I'm, I'm planning on trying to do this every every week, every Wednesday, and. Um, and when lockdown's lifted, if you're in Bristol, even even better. Steve said he's going to do the next show. He's going to do it with me from here. So. Well, I, I tell you one, uh, a, a nice person to speak to as well, Mike, who's just up the road from you, Glastonbury. Yeah. Oh, I love Mike. Mike. Kelly Plasby, Mike York, and um, you know Utopia Strong or what have you. He's a real. And he'll talk gear with you. you know. <laughs> oh, that could be good. We've got actually, yeah. I mean, great. I love Mike, um, but I think as well, um, you know, I'm. I really liked it today because I've, I've you know, done a little bit with the with the old synth here, but um, it's such a lot to talk about and such an incredible and, and I mean, fair play, what a career you've had so far. And thank you. you. Know. I'm just getting started. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel like that. So this was going to be this was going to be the year, um, but uh, oh, sadly, uh, yeah. this is not this is not the year. I know. I had such I had some fantastic things happening this year. Uh, anyway, but so that's the story, isn't it? But um, so Carver, so. Just to round up then for everybody um, out there, um, so hip to the jag, Carvus Tarabi. Can I can I plug can I plug my album? Yes, you can. Can I plug my album? Please if you want to go over to Bandcamp and yep. uh, just uh, just listen to it, hip to jag by uh, Carvus Tarabi, K A V S T O R A B I, and uh, see what you think. That's my new thing, mm. and um, I'm uh, I couldn't be happier. Yeah, I couldn't be happier with it. And then, of course, then Utopia Strong. I mean, that hasn't been out what six months, maybe. Oh uh, no, last it's uh, September last year. Yeah, yeah. So year. the Utopia Strong. I think oh, that will be on Spotify. It's on, I think I listened. Uh, it's to on, on Spotify. Apple They're all on yeah. Spotify. Yeah, as it's, uh, as it's my, yeah. And then uh, the Universe Also Collapses by Gong. Oh, That's that probably about. That was last year, beginning last of last year. year yeah. yeah. And um... <laughs> those are my three, my three most recent yeah, releases. Three most I'm, recent ones. I'm as happy with them as anything. So uh, ah, yes. that is fantastic. Well, Carlos, I will say thank you ever so much for joining. Yeah, thank joining you so us. much, and yeah. looking forward to seeing you uh, in real life again. Hopefully, in a in an open pub. 
in, in a <laughs> yeah. way that we can hug each other in real life. Oh, yeah. yes, bring it on. But um, yeah, and please, you know, if if there is a point in the future where you can come back and join us, that will be more. Well, than... <laughs> I'm not going anywhere at this point. You know, I'm, I'm always around. You know? <laughs> Amazing. Okay, and I'm going to say thank you so much to the chat room. I'm going to be reading through. Well, every, every... To all in the chat room. Yeah, there, there has been enduring my babble. <laughs> it's been a fabulous lots and lots of activity in the chat room so i'm going to really enjoy reading that through again apologies if you've been trying to get our attention i've been so engrossed in the conversation here uh but yes thank you everybody for joining us um as i say we will i will be back uh, next week um 8 p.m uh I'm not going to announce the guest just yet, but I've got a fantastic guest. Uh, so keep your ears and eyes posted on the various social medias for the announcement. And um, but yeah, but wow, Carvus, thanks once more, and I'm going to say goodbye to everybody and see you soon. Take care. Lots of love. Lots bye. of love. Hey, bye bye.